faith's corresponding action. Now, I thought we'd got through with this, but we didn't, so we're just going to continue with it. We're going to stay with it till you get it, because I'm, I'm convinced that this is one of the most needed teachings concerning faith and the action of faith that, the, that is in need in the church today, is understanding corresponding action. Now, I want us to go right to the scripture. We're in Mark, the fourth chapter where it talked about, so is the kingdom of God as if a man cast seed in the ground. He should sleep and rise night and day. The seed should spring and grow up, and he knoweth not how. But the, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. Now I want us to look zero in on the 29th verse. But when the fruit is brought forth, then immediately he putteth in the sickle. In other words, immediately you harvest when the fruit is brought, brought forth. But so many people get excited about faith. You can excite faith. And you students need to realize this. Don't just try to excite faith, but teach people how to operate in the principles of faith. There's a lot of people get excited, get their faith get excited, and they go out and they go beyond where they're developed to. See, that's the thing you don't want to do. You don't want to get people pushed out there beyond where they're developed to. Now, this is what happened to Peter when he got out of the boat to walk on the water. He was not developed to that point. You see, he said to Jesus, saw Jesus walking on the water coming, and they'd, probably, they'd been praying, boy, if Jesus was here, you know, I know things would be different. They look up and see Jesus coming, walking on the water. And then uh, Peter says, Lord, if it's really you, bid me to come. Now, he was not ready for water walking. <laughs> and there's a lot of Christians that are not ready for it. They've been to a few seminars, but they're not ready for it. But what... Peter did, and I said this in one of the other sessions, was that he forced Jesus in to call in him. He said, if it be you, bid me come. Well, what was Jesus going to say? No, it's not me. Forget it, Peter. You're not developed to it. Anything he said other than come was going to be a lie because it was Jesus. He said, if it's really you, bid me come. And all Jesus said was come. Now, Peter did walk on the water. But you notice he was not developed to the point that he was able to hold fast to that word of faith. He got involved with the circumstances. And when he did, he began to sink. Faith left him. Now you can excite people's faith to where they'll get out there and sink. Now I'm going to say that again because it needs to be said. There's been a lot of people that got excited they got excited about faith because of some story somebody told. Said, now this is the way it happened to me. And you know, this happened and, and all of it worked out good. Well, that person was developed to it. But now for you to go and do that same thing, it may be disastrous. So you students, when you, when you operate in this, practice this thing before you preach it. <laughs> A lot of people practice what they preach. You need to be preaching what you've practiced. And then... Don't just excite people's faith. Get them involved with the principles. Help them to understand it, you see. Because you can excite people beyond their ability. And Peter, that's what happened to Peter. He got, Peter got excited about, beyond his ability to operate in it. And that was not Jesus' intention to do that. But Peter kind of forced him into it, the way he said it. And some of you have done the same thing. You said, Lord, now, if it's your will for me to do this, well, let so-and-so happen. It was God's will for you to do that, but it wasn't God's will for that to happen. And you forced God into a situation where uh, it was a bad situation. Can you see that? Now, I, I want you to remember that. Don't just get people's faith excited. Now, let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. I went into a certain church, and I may have said this in one of the other sessions, but it bears repeating. Told how God supernaturally supplied gas for my airplane. I was lost out in the northwest part of the country, and and I flew five hours, 25 minutes when the airplane only held four hours and 30 minutes fuel. And when I landed, it still had 17 gallons of fuel in the airplane. The guy heard this, and he got all excited, see. And he went out, got in his car, started home. His wife said, now, we better get some gas. No, God put gas in Brother Cap's airplane. He'll put it in my car. 
drove five miles out in the country and run out of gas and called the pastor. The pastor had to get up and go get him. Now, this is some of the things that people do. See, excited faith. Well, I've learned when you tell that, tell them, now, look, this was an emergency. <laughs> God's not going to put gas in your car just because it's on empty. If it was an emergency situation, you, you were developed to that point, it would work. But God's not in the business of supplying gasoline for folks' car. You see what I'm saying? When I, now, this is an example of what I'm talking about, excited faith. Now, what we need to realize is that there is a corresponding action to faith. You act on that faith. Now, let's get it back. We, we were right on the verge of getting into this. In fact, we didn't mention it in the last session. In the area of healing, divine healing, and, and uh, receiving healing from God. Now, when people get the wrong idea of corresponding action concerning healing, you're going to end up with a lot of people in trouble. Some of them are going to die because many of them are not developed to the point that they can believe God for divine healing without a doctor or without the aid of medicine. They're not developed to that. And you, you push them out there and say, well, now, if you really believe God, you'll throw your medicine away. If you really believe God, you'd quit going to that doctor. Well, now, that's foolish. Now, it might be, you might be developed to that, if you are, fine and good. But don't try to put everybody up there where you are. People have to operate where they are. Now, see, we're talking about some practical things. See, don't push people out there. Now, once they get developed in it, they may get there. Some of them may never get there. Well, do you want them to die just because they're not developed in their faith? <laughs> no, no. So don't push them out there. Every individual has to know where. They can't start where Brother Hagin or Brother Copeland or, or Brother Oral Roberts is. They've got to start where they are. Some of them can believe God that if I go to the doctor and if he operates on me, I believe God will give him the wisdom of God and that, he'll, that, that I can believe God that I'll be well. Now, if that's where their faith is developed, that's what they ought to do. Now, you need, you need to take heed to this because there, there's a lot of people that's gotten in trouble over that. You've got people trying to believe, well, you know, doctor says I have cancer, and if I don't have an operation, why? If they say, well, they, uh, the doctor told me if I don't have an operation, why, you're going to die in a few months, and, and uh, you need to have it right now, but I'm just going to believe God. Well, no, that's all right if you develop there. But see, some of these people may not have been born again, but just six, eight weeks, you know. They may have been born again for years, but they've just been babies and never been taught anything and just happened to hear a few messages on healing and decided, bless God, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to believe God. And they haven't learned to believe God to get rid of a headache yet. And they're going to believe God to heal, you know, totally heal the cancer. Now, you're going to bury most of those people. And that's not what we're out to do. We're not out to mislead anybody or push somebody out beyond where they're developed. But you see, if those people can be taught and practice their faith and develop their faith, then eventually they may get to the point that they, they would be able to receive their healing and, and not have to go to a doctor, not have to take medicine. But if you try to push them out there, then you're going to have some funerals on your hands because they, they, some of them will die. And, and that's not to water down the faith message, see. See, acting, see, James said faith without works is dead. Faith without corresponding action. But see, he's talking about a man there that needed food and clothing. And if you don't give him something while your faith is dead, it's just saying go and be warmed and be healed. He's not talking about somebody that has been, the doctors told him you've got cancer and you're going to die in three months unless you have an operation and they're not developed in their faith, and they say, bless God, if I believe I've received my healing, then I've got to have corresponding act. I'm going to have full corresponding. I'm going to act as though I were already healed. You'll probably have a funeral because they're not developed to it. You see what I'm saying? It takes time to develop yourself in this. And every individual has to determine their own thing. Don't ever tell anybody to throw their medicine away. Now, this is just some practical things. 
If God tells them to throw it away, if they've received the, if they've got the full corn in the ear, then it's time to throw it away. But you see, medicine won't heal you anyway. Now there's some people that think, now I'm going to get healed just because I'm not taking medicine. That's my corresponding action. I'm not taking medicine, so I'll get healed because I don't take medicine. Not even believe in a promise of God. They just think if I, that's cost, that proves I got faith because I'm not taking medicine. It may prove you'll die young. <laughs> now, I told you we're going to get out on some nitty-gritty things. Certainly, you can develop yourself. Certainly, healing is a fact in the Bible. Certainly, God sent his word and healed us. But you see, it's like a farmer, that if he needs $30,000, and he makes $100 an acre off of wheat, and he goes out there and plants one acre of wheat and says, well, I got wheat, I'm going to get $30,000. No, he's not. He's going to get $100. It's not enough to pay his note. Some people are trying to operate on the ultimate faith when they're down here on this other level. So the farmer couldn't, couldn't receive the manifestation of his total need met when he didn't plant enough seeds to produce it. Kingdom of God's if a man cast seed in the ground. See, this is a process. When we're talking about confession and faith, or faith's confession and corresponding action, confession is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. And a lot of people have died confessing the word of God. Somebody said, I don't understand why they died. They were confessing the word, yeah, but they didn't get developed in it. See, you've got to start where you are. There's some people, I know some people, I happen to know some people that had had cancer for two or three years before they ever got even under this kind of teaching. Then they were just going to confess that they were healed. And they were not developed in it. Besides that, there was strife in the home. Boy, strife will kill you. It'll stop your faith from working. And, and, and they just you wouldn't go to the doctor, you know. Well, I preached the funeral. And somebody said, I don't understand it. She was saying all the right things. Yeah, she was, but it was too late. Confession is a process. See, I said, you need to plan these things way ahead, especially in finances or things that you know is going to come. Now, when, you, when it comes sickness or disease, why, you may not know way far ahead, but you know this, the Word of God will heal you, well, then it ought to keep you healed. See, some people make a mistake. They start confessing they're healed when they get sick. Now, the mistake I'm talking about they're making is they waited too late to start confessing it. You ought to confess the promise of God of healing and health and life and every disease, germ, every virus touches my body, dies instantly. I'm healed, well, delivered from the curse of the law while you're well. Use your faith on the front end. If people would, now, now you ought to write this down. The people, if people would use their faith on the front end like they try to use it on the back end, they would be ten times better off. Now, what I mean by that is, if the people that are confessing they're healed after they've got sickness and disease had have done all of that confessing before, it never would have come. Most probably never would have got sick. You see what I'm saying? What is it, the, the old saying, you know, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Well, there's some truth in that. See, use your faith on the front end. Confess that you're healed and well and, and refuse to allow sickness and disease in your body. And somebody said, well, what about doctors? Well, I'll tell you now, and just, just from my own experience and the way I operate in it, that doesn't mean you have to do it that way. But if I need a doctor, I'm going to go to a doctor. See, if I, if I get sick, I've already missed it. Because I'm confessing the Word of God daily. Confess it daily. Building yourself and develop yourself in the thing daily. If I get sick, I've already missed it. 
Air gunners, no need of dying before you find out where you missed it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, I know this rubs some people the wrong way. It makes some glad and some mad. But it needs to be said now. Because people are trying, some of them are trying to have corresponding action when they have the blade. And they don't have the full corn there. You notice it said here, when the harvest is brought forth, when the fruit is brought forth, then he immediately put it in the sickle. That's when you're going to have the men, when you're to have full corresponding action toward that crop is when, when it's already mature. When you have the manifestation of it. So certainly you wouldn't want to take medicine if, if you wasn't sick. And if the doctor says you're well and the x-ray says the cancer is gone and, and there's no need for it, then you'd be foolish to be taking medicine. You have full manifestation of the thing. The harvest has come. Now another thing that we need to inject here is that medicine won't heal you. If medicine won't heal you, then it wouldn't keep you from getting healed. Would it? See, I had an individual say to me one time, now, Brother Caps, I wouldn't ask you to pray for me. I said, well, why not? Well, he said, I'm taking medicine. I said, well, what's the medicine supposed to do? Well, he said, the doctor said it to help me. I said, well, the Bible says prayer to help you. The prayer of faith to save the sick and the Lord to raise them up. Look like if we do both of them, you get well twice as quick. <laughs> now, see, this is, this is one of the things that the devil has used and... and uh, and even religion has got involved in it and used it to put condemnation on people, is that, well, if you're going to believe God, you couldn't take medicine. In other words, you, you're just going to have to go whole hog on one or the other. Well, now, th th it's, there's some truth in that. I mean, in that uh, if a person was developed to that, he could operate in that. But now most of them are going to be like Peter. They're going to be out of the boat, boat before they have water walk in faith. They may make it for a while, but they sink because they haven't learned to not to observe circumstances, see. And, and when that fear comes, that's time, that, that's proof enough that they're not in faith. When they have to call you and say, why isn't it working? You better go to the doctor quick if you have to call somebody and say, why isn't it working? Because, see, you're not fully persuaded in that. So the, the thing that we need to realize is that you, you just don't want to push people out there and get them out there where they, where they get in all kinds of trouble. Because it will work. Healing is a fact. But now you see, you're going to have to operate where you developed it. I don't know whether I shared this with you or not, but I'm going to share it. It, it will bear repeating. There was a man in a certain city, and he got a hold of this, was born again, and uh, he thought it was the greatest thing he ever heard, that they were redeemed from the curse from sickness and disease and that God was a healer. Well, see, he'd been raised in a, in a church that, that didn't believe these things. Well, he just grabbed it whole hog, you know, and just accepted it and uh, mental assent to it anyway. And uh, he had sugar diabetes and five things. I believe I did mention this one of the other sessions. Any one of them enough to kill him. But you see, he just threw all of his medicine away and liked to die I counseled with him, some other brethren counseled with him. I said, now look, God sent his word and healed you. There's healing power in the word of God, but, but you know, the insulin will keep the symptoms down. Is it easier to believe you're, being, you're healed when you feel well or when you're hurting and about to die? See, the medicine, all the medicine is going to do is keep the symptoms down, make you able to operate. It's not going to heal you. Nobody ever got healed by taking insulin. Well, then on the other hand, you're not going to keep from getting healed by taking it. So I said, every time you take a dose, say, thank God a believer has seen the healing. Mix some faith with the Word of God and with the promises of God. And uh, so he did. He did the very thing. He confessed it, confessed it, confessed it. And see, he had five things wrong. Had cancer in both lungs, large heart, high blood pressure, highest blood pressure the doctor said he'd ever seen any man have and live. Well, about... Ninety days later, I saw the doctor's report. The doctor said, you got to take an insulin. You don't need it anymore. He said, your heart's perfectly normal. Your blood pressure's normal. There is no sign of spot in one lung. He said, just a very small spot in the other. He said, it's much smaller than it was. 
And the man got almost a total clear bill of health, see, in 90 days. I'm satisfied we'd have had his funeral if he hadn't got back on his medicine. Because he wasn't developed to that, see. And this is, this is why that, that you read some things in the newspaper here and there. And, and then when you're preaching faith, why people uh, say, well, you know, he's one of them guys that, that don't believe in doctors, you know, and believe that you just stay away from doctors and God will heal you. No, you won't get healed just because you stay away from doctors. But you see, there's people that can believe that if I take medicine and, and, and God will give the doctor wisdom, then I, I, I can be restored to health and God will heal. Ultimately, all healing comes from God. Doctors have just learned how to kind of aid the body process in, in healing and hold down some symptoms. So, so there needs to be some things said about this because people go out and, and try to go beyond their faith corresponding action, you see. Now, let, let me share, share with you and give you another example here. In the Bible, the 17th chapter of Luke, you find the story there where Jesus, there was 10, ten lepers came to Jesus. And they're standing out there far off, you know, they, they had to stay quite a ways away. And uh, verse 13 of Luke 17 says, And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourself to the priest. Now what kind of answer is this? Go show yourself to the priest. Now the only reason that you'd go show yourself to the priest was if you've been cleansed. If you've been cleansed, see, that was the law. If you've been cleansed and if you no longer have leprosy, well, you go show yourself to the priest and he'll pronounce you clean. Now, they're standing there and, and Jesus hadn't prayed for them. He just said, go show yourself to the priest. See, God sent his word and healed them. Now, the Bible says, as they went, they were cleansed. Now, see, the going was the corresponding action. As they went, they were cleansed. This was as far as they could go with their corresponding action at that point. They didn't have the manifestation at that time. See, they could have said, but Jesus, we're not well yet. But they acted as far as they could on what Jesus said. Now, if they didn't believe what he said, they wouldn't have gone. See, now, they went. As they went, they were healed. I wonder what would have happened if they hadn't went. <laughs> now, they came, there's one of them came back. And Jesus says, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Now, as far as Jesus was concerned, ten of them were cleansed. Because he spoke the word over all of them. Go show yourself to the priest. There is times when corresponding action is necessary. See, go as far as you can with it in confessing the Word of God and as far as you can act as though it were true. But don't go out and do crazy things. See, don't go beyond your faith. See, to, to act as though you believe, to have corresponding action to something that you really believed if you had prayed for a certain situation, you wouldn't stay up and worry about it all night. Somebody said, I just stayed up and prayed about it all night long. Well, if you'd prayed in faith, you'd gone to sleep. You'd have had some corresponding action about that. Now, it's possible that you could have interceded in the spirit about that thing all night and been perfectly legal, see, or prayed the word of God over it. But to just keep praying to God about the same thing, then if, if you ask a petition of God to do something and you ask him all night long, then you see, you didn't have corresponding action. The corresponding action would have been gone to sleep and believe it's taken care of. So here are these ten men. I'm convinced, I'm not, I'm not so sure but what nine of them didn't lose their healing. See, Jesus said, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Then he turned to this man and says, go thy way, uh, thy faith has made thee whole. Or, or arise and go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. Now notice, it was his faith. It was his faith. And his faith was released in his corresponding action. He went when Jesus said go. 
it's possible. Now, it doesn't say it in the Bible. And I know I can't prove it, but uh, you can't prove that it's not so. <laughs> so. So let's look at it from both aspects, and you can just take it or leave it. It's possible that the other nine were not, did not receive the total manifestation. It's possible they said, bless God, we're not going down there because we're not healed. I'm not going down and show myself to the priest. I ain't nothing changed. Look, I'm just as bad as ever was. But as far as Jesus was concerned, they were healed. But nothing else for him to do. He'd spoken the word. But you see, it's possible that sometimes there must be some corresponding action to some things, but take it as far as you can, but don't take it over into the, to the foolishness and, and, and see that you wouldn't have complete corresponding action until you had the full manifestation. Now, let's, let's look at another situation. I want to use some personal experience. Now, I, I use these not, not to get you to try to do it this way, but to show you and, and give you teach by example, see. I had, when I was farming, I had a crop of wheat. Uh, we had planted wheat, and it didn't come up to a good stand. And I told uh, the men that worked for me, I said, now, while I'm gone, if it gets dry enough, you plow that up. It's just, it's just not enough out there. My wife said, uh, let's, let's just pray over that wheat and confess the Word of God over it and, and believe that it'll produce. I said, well, now, you know, I'm a faith man, all right, but, you know, you've got to have something to confess over. And I said, I just don't, it just don't look to me like there's enough out there to even use your faith on, hardly. And uh, so we went to a meeting when we came back. Why? Well, it had rained, and they didn't get plied up. Well, began to look at it, and it looked a little better, see? So uh, she talked me into it, so we, we went out there and talked to the wheat and spoke faith filled words over it, read the Bible to it. Read over there in Malachi, see, where he talked about that uh, uh, God would bless the, the fruit of your ground and he had rebuked the devourer and so on. Just read the Bible to it. Spoke faith-filled words over it. Took the word of God and, and mixed our faith with it and confessed and the promises of God over it. Well, to make a long story short, well, when we cut the wheat that fall, why, that field cut 50 bushels of acre which is a very good crop, you know. Now, some of the other cut as much as 70, but that cut 50. And uh, see, our corresponding action was not that we went out there and started saying, well, we believe we've got a good crop, so let's combine the wheat when we've got a blade. We confessed over it. We fertilized it. We didn't say, well, we've confessed the Word of God over it now. We're not going to fertilize it. We're just going to believe God's Word will fertilize it. See, you get people that do that sometimes. You don't throw away good business practices just because you operate in faith. See, you use common sense with it. Now, we could have said, we're not going to water it. We, we're not going to fertilize it. We're not going to take care of it. We're just going to believe God. Well, you're not going to have a harvest either. You can have corresponding action, but you can't have the full corresponding action until you have the full manifestation. Now, see, that especially over in the area where we were talking about healing is where it's the most devastating to people and causes some of the most, uh, most problems is because people try to act as though they were healed even to the point of uh, throwing their medicine away and, and uh, not doing those things because they say, well, that'll prove I got corresponding action. But you see... That's what gets a lot of people in trouble. So have full, have corresponding action as far as you can toward the thing. Now, in the area of sickness, in the area of healing, your corresponding action toward that would be confessing the Word of God daily. Now, there's people that'll tell you this, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to criticize them. I just disagree with them. That your car, if you're confessing you're healed, then why... Would you be taking medicine? If you're not sick, why would you take medicine? You're taking medicine for something you don't have. You do have it. Just saying you're not sick is not going to make you not sick. If you're sick, you're sick. Now, you don't want to go around confessing you're sick all the time. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? That doesn't mean you're denying it. 
but you just don't want to give assent to it. You don't deny that it exists. You deny its right to exist in your body. Now, I'm going to say that again. You don't deny that you're sick. You deny the right of that sickness to exist in your body, and you confess the Word of God over it. And this is corresponding action toward that. See, you're calling for a manifestation of healing. And until it's manifest, you don't have the full corn in the ear. So you would not have full corresponding action toward that. Now, if you will operate on that basis, you'll find out it'll help you. You, you use your faith as far as you can to the point you're developed to. And then there will come a day like the man did that I was telling you about that confessed his healing while he was taking his medicine, when he had the, the full manifestation, the full fruit. When the fruit is brought forth, then immediately the sickle is put in, then you'd have full corresponding action toward that thing. Now let me give you another example. There was a piece of property that was uh, available to, to us there in England, Arkansas, and right next to my office. The man had it up for sale, and, and I made an offer on it. And uh, he turned it down. I thought it was a decent offer. And uh, the real estate lady said, well, I believe he'll eventually get it. Said, uh, I'll kind of keep an eye on it. Well, when I made the offer on it, I went out and walked around the piece of property. I talked to it. I spoke to it. Just like Jesus said in the sixth chapter of Luke, if you, he that cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I'll show you who is like. Like the man that built his house, dig deep, laid the foundation on a rock. When the stream beat vehemently against it, it could not shake it. In other words, he prophesied, if you do his sayings, then when the storms of life came, they wouldn't shake you. So I went out and did just what Jesus said. I talked to it. I talked to, you see, he said, talk to the sycamine tree, speak to the mountain, speak to whatever. So I walked around this piece of property and talked to it. See, this is a principle of the kingdom, calling things that are not. And I said, ground, I'm talking to you. I call you into the ministry. And Jesus said you would obey me. So I say you are mine in Jesus' name. I call you into this ministry. And I just walked around over it and talked to it. Claimed it with the promise of God. Now you have some people that say, well, now bless God, I don't believe in this name it and claim it stuff. Well, I do. God named it and I claim it. See, the, people don't understand that what you're doing is just operating in Bible principles. And I know you can carry it too far and sometimes that's what they're talking about. Just claiming everything. You've got to have scripture for it, see. So I walked around and talked to this property and, and I said, you come to me in Jesus' name. Now, I believed and released my faith when I prayed. Now, I've developed myself in this, and I want to I put this in here because some people hear these stories and they say, well, bless God, it worked for him, I'm going to go do it. Now, I'm not telling you not to go do it, but I'm telling you, you have to develop yourself in it. It may not work as quick for you. It may take time for it to come to pass. The more highly developed you get in releasing your faith in your words and believing what you say will come to pass, the quicker you'll have the manifestation. So I went on. Several weeks and months passed. Now, corresponding action, see, to what I believed, I prayed about it. I, I, as I walked over the property, not only did I talk to it, I prayed. I said, now, Father, I claim this piece of property, and, and I ask you to cause it to come to me. I've spoken to it. I've done everything I know to do concerning it. I've made the man a good offer, and it's a fair offer. And I went on. So the corresponding action that I had, I never did pray about that anymore. I confessed and thanked God that I received, that the property would come to me. Every time I'd go by it, I'd say, you're mine. You're mine. And uh, several months went by. Well, one morning we went to work, and, and there's a big old sign sitting up out there on that piece of property and said, future home of the Production Credit Association. And I, I, I remember I went in the office and I told my wife, I said, you see that sign out there on our piece of property? She said, yeah, I saw that. Well, it, my head gave me trouble over that, see. 
Now, what I mean by that, just like it gave Peter trouble when he got out of the boat and began to see the wind and the waves so high, began to give him trouble over it. And um, I thought about it. In fact, I talked to my wife about it. I said, uh, you know, after just really didn't think what I was saying, but I was talking to her one day, and I said, you know, maybe I ought to go talk to them people about that piece of property. Because, see, in, in my mind, in my carnal mind, I was thinking this way, you know, it may get away. And then I got to thinking about it. See, my mind kept bugging me over it, my carnal mind. Finally, one morning, I, I realized what was happening, and I just, I just hollered out loud. I was, you know, just walking through the house and by myself. And, and it kept bugging me, so I just hollered out loud. I said, I know what I'll do. Nothing. That's as far as I can go toward my corresponding action, see. That's as far as I can go. Now, see, I wouldn't, it'd have been foolish to go down to the courthouse and said, I want to file a deed on this piece of property over here because it's mine. And they said, well, where's the deed? Well, it's not manifest yet. I don't know, they'd have run me out of there and said, that guy's nut. See, that's trying to have full corresponding action before the fruit of the manifestation comes. So as far as I could go toward that, was to just do nothing because I'd done all I could do. I'd made the man offer. I'd talked to the property. I'd done everything the Word said to do about it. I'd prayed about it. And now it's time to just rest in what you've said and what you've done. So the full, as far as I could go with corresponding action is to just say, I'm going to do nothing about it as far as, you know, talking to them or anything. Well, few weeks went by and, and you know they're making plans already got the plans drawn up to build a building out there on this piece of property and uh, I was down at the White River where we have a little fishing camp down there one day and I was taking dominion over the fish of the sea and I got a phone call and uh, my wife said uh, that's a real estate lady wants to talk to you right away so I called her and she said uh, are you still interested in that piece of property and uh, I said well yeah sure am well, she said, would you give what you offered for it? I said, yeah, yes, I would. Well, she said, you know, it's funny. She said, they've decided they want to build over here on this other street. <laughs> I said, I don't doubt it. <laughs> see, now, now the full manifestation has come, see. And uh, she said, in a few days, I'll have it all drawn up, and you can come by and pick up the deed and so on. So, you see, it was because of inaction was my corresponding action in that situation, see. See, sometimes corresponding action will mean that you just don't do anything. Now, don't take that out of the context of which I said it now. See, somebody say, well, bless God, I owe this bill, but Brother Cap said corresponding action is do nothing, so I'm not even going to look for a job or not try to find any money to pay this bill. Well, now, see, you've, you've pulled it out of context, and here you are over here doing crazy things again. <laughs> Now, you ought not have to say these things, but you do, see. Because there's somebody out there that's going to misunderstand it that way. Now, that's the reason when I use example, you're going to have to back up and go all the way around that example and explain to people that I'm not meaning that if you owe a bill that you don't do nothing about it. But if you've done all you can do, now listen to this, if you've done all you can do, all the Word of God said to do, all that you know to do naturally about that situation, and you've prayed and believed God, and there's nothing else that you could do, then that's the time to do nothing and rest in what you've already done. Can you see that? Now let me give you an example of that in, in, in another area, which uh, Jairus did. He came to Jesus, you know, and said, my little daughter is at home and she's at the point of death, but if you come lay your hands on her, she'll be healed and she'll live. Well, now, Jesus went with him, and they're going down there to get his little daughter healed. And, and this woman with the issue of blood comes along, and she gets her healing, testifies, tells them all the truth, and, and it probably took them an hour or so for all that to happen. And then the runner comes down there and said, your little daughter's already dead. Your daughter's already dead. Now, Jairus has done all he can do. He's released his faith that if Jesus lays his hands on his daughter, she'll be healed. He's done all he knows to do. And Jesus, when he hears the bad news, he said, Fear not, only believe. See, now that's the situation I was in, in that situation. I'd done everything I could do. I'd made the offer. I'd prayed over it. I'd spoken to the ground. I'd called it into the ministry. 
Now, there's nothing else I can do but only believe. Believe what? Believe what I've said. Believe what I've established. Believe what the Word of God says. That is not the time, see, in Jairus' situation especially, is not the time to start trying to make faith confessions. If he did, he'd have gotten fear and unbelief. See, he'd have probably said, now, if you hadn't stopped and healed this Baptist lady, you'd got there in time to heal my daughter. But Jesus said, don't do anything but believe. See, he's gone far as he can go. Now his corresponding action is going to be to just be quiet. See, I believe it's Psalms 37 or somewhere along in there. It says, rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. See, there's a time to rest in the Lord. Sometimes corresponding action is to just rest in what you've already done if it's to the point that you don't know anything else to do. See, we get people all the time that call and say, say, well, now, Brother Caps, I've done everything that the Word says to do. I've done everything that, that I know to do. I've done everything naturally that I know to do to try to uh, bring this situation under control, and I, I'm just at my ropes in. What do I do? Well, Paul said, when you've done all to stand, stand. Rest in the Lord. If there's nothing else you can do, then the corresponding action is to just say, I know what I'll do. Nothing. Because I've done it all. I've done all I know to do. And then you just have to rest in that, see. But you've got to be careful and be sure that you've done all that you know to do. See. It's not the fact that you didn't do anything. Now, see, if you're not careful, people get this idea. Well, it's just the doing nothing that made it happen. <laughs> no. It wasn't, the, it wasn't the inactivity that made it happen, but the inactivity sometimes, now notice I said sometimes, is the corresponding action needed. But in the case of the ten lepers, the corresponding action needed was to go. And as they went, they were cleansed. But I'm not convinced, I'm not so sure that the, the nine didn't lose their healing. But you see, sometimes... Corresponding action means doing something in faith, but not something foolish, not something crazy, but act as far as you can with corresponding action. Then on the other hand, sometimes it means to just do nothing at all, just rest in what you've already done. I think sometimes the, the problem uh, that people get into is when they get, when their faith is low. They start trying to make faith confessions, and they make them out of fear. You can say all the right things and say them in fear instead of faith. You can confess the Word of God in fear. It can be done. And see, some people are doing that. That's, that's why that you find out sometimes that see, somebody said, well, they're saying all the right things, but they died. Sometimes they're doing it in fear. It has to be in faith, see. And that's why you can't judge things just because of what happened. Why, it just looked like that they were operating perfect in it. But you don't know where they were. You don't know what they were really believing. Sometimes they were saying those things because they really believed the opposite was coming. And sometimes they were too late saying them. See, so corresponding action is necessary in some situations. In fact, I guess you could say it's necessary in every situation. Sometimes it is something that you do by faith. Sometimes it's something you didn't do by faith. Action on faith. Well, let's say it this way. We, we mentioned this in one of the other sessions. Faith's action is God's personality and manifestation. See, if somebody comes, <laughs> if something says something different from what God says, he doesn't get excited about it because he's already released his faith in what he said. See, we need to learn that. And when we do, see, this corresponding action thing has two sides to it. So don't forget that. Now, read the next chapter in the book and study your notes, and we're going to go into some different areas in the next session and share some things uh, about confession that will help you in that area. Now, see, these things have to be said they need to be said, and when you get out there teaching it, you need to say it. Because you can, you can save people lots of problems if you teach the whole thing and don't leave a lot of things unsaid. And it'll help them.
and confession. We're talking about confession of God's Word or agreeing with God's Word. Now, I want us to talk about something today uh, that's involved in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 1, where the writer says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about hope. We're going to talk about hope and uh, what hope does. See, faith is the substance of things, but hope is necessary. Sometimes people say, well, now, you know, you don't get anything by hoping. Well, there's no substance to hope. But we do need hope, and you need to know that, because hope is a goal setter. If you'll notice here, he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now notice, it is the substance of the thing. Of what thing? The thing you hope for. Well, what are we hoping for? Well, certainly we would hope for the thing that God has given us. You see, that's why the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's because God is not pleased when we don't enter into the provisions that God made for us. There are some things that you and I will never enter into except through faith. That's the only way you can enter into them. God's willingness is multiplied to us through the knowledge of God. The Apostle Peter says this in the Second Peter chapter 1 where he said God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But now let's center up on hope here because um, hope is a very important part of anything because You came, you students came to the Bible school hoping to receive something, hoping to be taught some things. Well, you see, hope won't cause it to happen just because you had hope. But you see, if it wasn't for hope, you wouldn't have come. So you wasn't going to get any Bible schooling if you didn't go to school, (laughs) if you didn't go. It's like people come many times in a prayer line and they hope to be healed. Now, I remember when I first got turned on to the word of faith that I, you know, if I heard anybody talk about hope, I'd tell them, you're not going to get anything by hope. Because, you know, we, we really didn't think hope had any part in it. But the more you study the word of God, the more insight you get into it. Hope is a very necessary part. If hope is the substance of things hoped for, I mean, if, if faith is the substance of things hoped for, then there has to be some hope or you wouldn't have anything for faith to give substance to. Can you see that? Now this will explain to you why that sometimes, you know, you hear people die. Well, so-and-so died and, and uh, I just don't understand it because they were saying all the right things. They had prayed and agreed. See, everybody knew there was no hope medically for them. But you know, I like what Abraham did. When there was no hope naturally, it says, when Abraham, when there was no hope, Abraham believed in hope. Now see, that's the fourth chapter of Romans, where it says God, uh, uh, refers to God saying to Abraham, I have made thee the father of many nations, in verse 17 there. So it says, Abraham, when there was no hope, he believed in hope. Now, how could you believe in hope when there was no hope? See, there's people today that there is no hope medically for them because doctors have done all they can do, see, and there's just some things that they can't do. So, as far as medical science is concerned, the doctor says there is no hope. Well, do what Abraham did. Go to the Word of God and get you some hope. Get you some supernatural hope, you see. That's what Abraham did. He just decided he'd side in with God. And you see, that's all we're doing when we decide to confess the Word of God. You're just siding in with God, getting on God's side, saying what God said. See, somebody might uh, say, well, you know, there's no hope, so you might as well give up. But see, uh, you can always go to the Word of God and get you some hope. I don't care whether it's physically, financially, spiritually, or whatever situation you're in where it seems to be hopeless. Go to the Word of God and get you some hope. God's Word's filled with hope. Now, see, hope is a goal setter. You've got to have a goal. You know, someone said it this way, and uh, if you didn't have a goal set, if you didn't know where you were going, how would you know when you got there? 
And then right on the other hand, how long would it take you to get there? And what route would you take to get there? <laughs> so you see, you just, there is no, you don't know where you're going, you don't know what you're doing, unless you have a goal setter. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So there has to be some direction to faith. You can't just say, well, you know, I'm just going to believe God. Now, I've seen people that said, well, I'm just waiting on God. I'm just believing God. And you know some of those people are still waiting on God and believing God and haven't done anything since. They're not waiting on God. God's been waiting on them for 17 years to get some direction in the thing. But you see, you're going to have to decide on some things. Now, when there was no hope, Abraham just simply decided, I'm going to believe in hope. What did he do? He decided, he made a decision to believe God's Word. That's where the hope came from. Hope is a goal setter. And you need to realize that. Now, don't try to use faith where hope should be and don't try to use hope where faith should be. See, hope has no substance. There's no substance to it. But faith is the substance of the thing hoped for. So there must be faith, and that faith is the divine energy of God. It comes from the Word of God, and it comes by hearing God's Word. It is the substance of things desired, the things hoped for. Now, see, in the last session, we talked about the sowing the seed of God's Word, or our words being seeds, and we speak the Word of God, the promise of God, into our heart, and then it springs and grows up, and we don't know how. First the blade, then the ear, and the full corn in the ear. Well, in this passage of Scripture, it was very well established by Jesus and many other things that Jesus said, that the heart was the production center. It's the thing that produced. It was called the soil. Now, I want us to go a little further into that, and we're going to say some things that we've kind of left unsaid about it. The heart is the production center. Now, if you want some reference to this, I'm not going to take time in this session to go into it, but 2 Corinthians, the, the first chapter, and we've mentioned this a few times, and I, I will quote some of it here. Uh, Paul said, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. I have not seen, ear hath not heard. How many times you heard people say that? And they'd quote that and say, you just never know what God's going to do. <laughs> well, you will if you read the next verse. <laughs> you know, stop too quick. He said, but God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. See, he's saying these things won't enter into the heart of man through the natural five senses realm. See, you, you, you can't get this information into you through the natural five senses realm. But he said God reveals it to us by his Spirit. So God's Spirit, bearing witness with our spirit, reveals the revelation knowledge of the Word of God. So when Paul said that, he wasn't telling you that you're just never going to find out what God's going to do, but, but a lot of people, I've heard them quote it, and they'll just quit right there and say, well, you know, never know what God's going to do, but you do. God will do everything that He said He'll do. God will do everything He promised to do. He'll do everything you believe Him to do. Now, he said, these things have not entered into the heart of man. I have not seen it, ear hath not heard it, the natural ear or the natural eye has not seen it. It hasn't entered into the heart of man. Now, you can't take that and say that by no means has it entered into the heart of man because he says right after that, he says, but God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. So God did reveal it. But it didn't come through the five senses realm. You see what he's saying? So there is a avenue which God reveals things that bypasses the intellect or the mind as a carnal mind as far as that's concerned and God just reveals some things see the Holy Spirit as our teacher and guide so he says he reveals those things to us in fact I thought we wasn't going to do it but let's turn to that you need to see that you need to mark it in your Bible if you do. second Corinthians the second chapter
I'm sorry, it's 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, second chapter. That's verse 10 that we just quoted. But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now here, it's in the King James, it has a capital S with spirits here in verse 10. The, both of these. Now the first part where it says, but God has revealed them to us by his Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit. But when it says, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, that is not the Holy Spirit, that is the human spirit. That is your spirit. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of his belly. That's Proverbs 20, 27. We've mentioned it several times before. In other words, the human spirit is the light that God uses to enlighten you. God's spirit beareth witness with our spirit. So God's spirit bears witness with our spirit and enlightens our spirit. So here when it says, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, he's not referring to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit does not have to search the things of God. The Holy Spirit knows the things of God. It's the human spirit that searches the things of God while you're asleep. While you go to bed and get up, the seed you planted in the heart is producing, and you don't know how. All you did was sow it and go to bed and get up. See, we talked about that. Now, let's notice as we go on down. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. God's spirit knows all about it. God, your spirit knows all about you. So you get those two spirits together and you've tapped the source of all knowledge. Now we have received, verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. We have received the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now you see what he's saying? See, connect this with what the Apostle Paul said over there. I had not seen, ear had not heard, or, or back up here. I had not seen, ear had not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man through the natural five senses gate. You didn't see it by the eye, the physical eye. You didn't hear it by the natural ear, but God revealed it. It came into the Spirit. It came by revelation of the Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So while you sow the seed into your heart and you sleep night and day, your spirit searches the wisdom and revelation of God of how to bring that to pass. And then you wake up some morning with an idea, and, and it'll be from the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's the reason God gave us the human spirit. That's why we are a spirit being, so he could reveal the things of God. Now look at verse 14. For the natural man, well, well, let's don't skip that other verse. Verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Now, see, you've got to compare spiritual things with spiritual. The spirit of man contacts the spirit of God to find out the revelation knowledge of these things. You don't gain revelation knowledge into the carnal mind. It comes into the spirit first. Now, the natural man, the natural man could involve two things there. The, the natural physical body does not receive the things of the spirit of God. The things of the spirit of God are received into the human spirit. That's the production center. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Now, who is he that is spiritual? See, he said, compare spiritual things with spiritual. Now, he that is spiritual or the part of you that is spiritual is the spirit man. And your spirit judges all things. Now, we don't have a lot of time to spend on this, but, uh, but I want to say this. This will help you understand some things. Your human spirit picks up things about other people and their spirit that you don't understand with your natural intellect. 
It hasn't been revealed to you through the eye or through the natural ear or the five senses gate, but you just sense some things that you know some things and you don't know how you know that you know you know them, but you know you know them. And, you know, you may meet somebody and it just seems like your spirit says, just, just get away from that guy. Just don't have anything to do with that individual. And you don't know why. But your spirit will just draw up in a knot, so to speak. When, because your spirit's searching all things. And it says right here that uh, he that spiritual judgeth all things, but yet he himself is judged of no man. See, See you can't judge my spirit, judge what's in, in my spirit. Now, you may judge my actions. But then he goes on and says, uh, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. See, we gain the knowledge of the mind of Christ through the spirit realm, through the human spirit. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of his belly. In other words, the revelation that comes to us comes through the human spirit. Now, let's take from that and show you and put these two things together that we've, we've talked about is the, the heart of man in Mark, the fourth chapter, is considered to be the saw, where you plant the seed of the word of God and it produces the spirit here, it says, is the, the thing that reveals to you or gains the knowledge. God has given us his spirit that we might receive the things of the spirit of God. So the heart is the reception center. Now, when you speak words, you're sowing seed. Especially when you're speaking the word of God, you're sowing an incorruptible seed. Now, that seed will not fail. But yet, it is possible for your action or inaction to cause there not to be a harvest. See, the seed won't fail. But what we do with the seed could cause a production failure. Now, Proverbs makes a statement. I think it's in chapter 22. It, it's kind of a strange statement, but yet it's a lot of truth in it. It says, the slothful man says there's a line in the street. There's a line in the street. I shall be eaten. <laughs> man, that's dumb. If you just pardon the expression, that's dumb. I mean, just because there's a line in the street, the slothful man, the one that's not going to do anything, he just sits there and says, I'll just be eaten. He doesn't even have enough energy to get up and leave, you know. I mean, he could get out of the street. He just prophesies his own doom. And you know, people that don't want to act on the Word of God, they're doing that all the time. Well, you know, we're all going under. Nothing's ever going to work out. You know, the world's all going to blow up in a big atomic blast and we're all going to be doomed. No, I said the slothful man says that. He prophesies his own doom. But when we get into the, the Scriptures here, we find out that you're capable of conceiving God's Word in your spirit and bringing forth the production of what God said in His Word. Now, let me get this over into an uh, area where you can understand it. The soil. I know that sometimes it's hard for us to... I don't know why we do it, but sometimes it seems like when we start s seeing these things in the Bible, we want to take them completely out of their natural setting. When Jesus talked about sowing a seed... He didn't take it away from the soil and say that this is a spiritual thing and it's just totally different from sowing a seed. In fact, it's, it's, it's right in line with sowing seed, playing a seed in the soil. But sometimes we miss that, so we, we try to say it so many ways that you, you won't miss it. Now, let me give you an illustration about even this building or your own house. There is a unit outside this building or maybe on the roof that's called the uh, air conditioning or heating unit, it's called the heart of that unit. Now, that unit is designed to control the temperature of this building. See, now, you thought we've already forgot about what we started out on, but we're not. We're still talking about goal setters. <laughs> Hope is a goal setter. So we're talking about how to set goals. You do it by speaking some things and by renewing your mind. Now, outside this building, there is a unit, it's called the heart of the unit, that is designed by the engineers to do 
no more than just control the temperature of this building. That's what it's designed to do. It is designed actually to produce whatever you dial in to that little goal setter on the wall over there, which is called a thermostat. Now, we can all understand that, see, thermostat. You know how it works. So that heart of that unit is somewhere else. You don't see it. But its job is to produce whatever you dial in that thermostat. The numbers on that thermostat represent degrees of temperature in this building. So if you were to come in this building and it's 90 or 100 degrees outside and you want 70 degree temperature in this building, you would turn that goal setter to 70 degrees. Now you wouldn't have to lay down on the floor and, and moan and groan and fast and pray that it'd get cool in here. <laughs> it just works that way, man. I mean, you dial the, the goal setter and it will send an impulse to the heart of that unit and says, get us some cold air in here. It's hot. Now, you, you can all understand it. You can relate to that, can't you? All right, suppose that you dial that thing to... See, you've actually, what you've done, when you set that goal setter on 70 degrees and it's 100 degrees outside, you have created a problem for the heart of that unit. Now, that's like a man being in a bad financial situation or bad physical condition and he sets his goal on healing or abundance. He's created a problem for his heart, for the soul, for the production center. Now you see, that, that unit on that roof won't wash your clothes, it won't cook your dinner. It won't keep your house. It was not designed to. It was designed for one purpose, and that is to produce what you dial into the goal setter. That's the way it's made. Now, if you'll relate this to the heart of man, you see that unit out there, the heart of that unit is like the heart of an individual that it mentions in Mark, the fourth chapter. And you dial something in there. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is the goal setter. That thermostat is the goal setter. You know where your goal setter is? This is your goal setter. Your goal setter. What you speak, what you think, and what you speak becomes your goal setter. See, it's controlled by the head. Your head's the goal setter. It's like that thermostat on the wall. It will send an impulse. Now, see, we've talked about this in the other sessions, and if you'll review your notes, you'll see it, that uh, you send an impulse down in here by your own words, by saying, I set my goal on healing. In the name of Jesus, by his stripes I'm healed. I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. I forbid sickness or disease in this body. Now, what are you doing by that? Somebody said, oh, you're just lying because you're sick. No, I'm setting my goal. Now, see, you'll have people that'll say that. It's because they don't understand it. They'll say, how can you say you're healed by the stripes of Jesus when you hurt? That's like asking a guy. He comes into the room, 90 degrees in here, and he turns the thermostat to 70. And somebody says, you can't do that. That's a lie. It's not 70 degrees in here. I know it. That's the reason I set it on 70. I'm calling for that. Now, did you ever see anybody stand back by the, <laughs> by the thermostat and want to argue with you when you turned it to cool? They'd say, you can't do that. It's not cool in here. That'd be ridiculous, wouldn't it? I mean, that, that, that guy's about ready for the nut house. <laughs> Makes you wonder about some of these other things, don't it? But it's because people don't think. They don't think beyond their nose sometimes. Now, you go, you're going to have to give some time and meditation to the Word of God. Now, I know this is a hypothetical situation, and I'm using natural things to relate to it. But you see, that's the way Jesus did. Now, you can understand the way that goal setter on that thermostat works. It works that way. Now, you may not believe it works that way. You may not like it because it works that way, but that's the way it works. Regardless of what you think or believe, that's the way it works. 
Now, no one would argue with you about turning that, and, and nobody would call you a liar or wouldn't say that you're trying to live in a world of fantasy because you turned the goal setter to 70 degrees because they understand it'll be 70 degrees in here in just a few minutes or a few hours anyway. Now, the heart of man is like that heart of that unit out there. It's designed of God to produce the very thing that you set in it. Now, the way you put the goal in there is that you speak it. Now, see, we talked about the tape recorder. When you first heard your voice on a tape recorder, you thought it was somebody. You couldn't believe it was you because you've been hearing yourself all these years with it almost totally with the inner ear. Your voice is picked up by the inner ear, fed directly into the human spirit. So when you heard it on a tape recorder, for the first time you heard it totally with the outer ear, and you couldn't believe it was you. But it's the way we've been hearing you all this time. Now God designed you that way so your voice would feed the impulse of what you desired right down in here into the garden spot, into the soil, into the heart, where it will produce what you are speaking there. Now we'll get into this further on in, in one of the other sessions where we talk about uh, renewing the mind. You see, it's, it's renewing your mind when you're confessing God's Word. You have to renew your mind. You have to get the goals that are set on these things. Now let's get back to the thermostat. Somebody goes back there and turns that thermostat on 70. And then uh, in a little bit they run back there and turn it on 95. Then a little bit, they come back and turn it to 60. And it's just up and down. You're going to blow a fuse after a while because of the head pressure in that unit out there. It's, it's just not going to work. It's not going to work properly that way. It'll end up blowing a fuse or a circuit somewhere because it's just not designed to be flipped from one side to the other all at once. It'll short circuit the thing. Now, we can understand that. Well, we'd think, well, who in the world would be dumb enough to do that? But you see, Christians do that all the time. They start making these faith confessions. Glory to God, my needs are met according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And they say it for a little while, and then, then they face the circumstances and say, Dear God, it's never going to happen. We'll never get these debts paid, and I don't know what we're going to do. Well, you just turn the gold center back. The thing you have to do is set it there and leave it there. Now, that unit will work day and night to produce what you've dialed into it. It'll never fuss about it. It'll never argue with you. Now, we'd be in a mess if we went back there and turned the thermostat to 70 degrees and, and the heating unit out there hollered real loud and said, No, we're not sending cold air. I believe you need hot air, so we're kindling up the fire. We're going to send you some heat. Well, brother, we'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? And then we'd, we could say, Well, you just never know what that unit's going to do. <laughs> well, who would want a unit like that? You wouldn't need one like that, would you? Well, now, you see, this is what the heart of man is designed. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of his belly. Mark, the fourth chapter, tells you the way it works is that it is if a man casts the seed into the ground or set the goal setter. You see, a seed to a farmer is a goal setter. Do you realize that? If you want to know what goal you've set in your garden, just look and see what seed you planted. That's what she's going to be. It's going to come up just like you planted. So you speak the thing. You speak it in there. And then it works. He goes to bed and he gets up. He goes to bed and he gets up. He doesn't have to hope to God it'll work. It'll work because it's designed that way. Now what if some guy came, you know, somebody went out on the street, and they got this guy and, and talked him into coming to the meeting. And he comes in, and, and uh, he comes early, you know, and the guy goes back there. It's hot in there. So he turns that thermostat 70 degrees, and it starts getting cool. Fan comes on, starts blowing cool air. And this old boy, you know, he may have been raised out in the boonies somewhere or uh, a hermit out in the mountains, just come to town to get some groceries. He don't know anything about electricity. He don't know anything about anything <laughs> that's modern. And he's sitting there thinking, my, it's getting cool in here. wonder what that guy did. So I asked him, he says, what is that little box on the wall? He said, well, that's the thermostat. 
thermostat. Where can I get one of them? And you see what he's got in mind? He's going to get one and go nail it on his cabin wall. <laughs> and uh, after the service is over, he runs down to the hardware store. Says, I want a thermostat. So they give him a thermostat. Now he goes out to his cabin and he nails it on the cabin wall. Turns it to 70 degrees, just sits down and goes grinning. He's going to get it cold in there because he's got the thermostat. <laughs> well, you know what happened. He's going to get hot. It's not going to work. He's going to get up and beat on that thing. Why isn't it working? Why doesn't this work? That's only a goal setter. It won't work from the goal setter. It was never designed to work. There's no substance in that thing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, see, we said faith is the divine energy of God. Now, the heart of that unit has hooked to it at all times the substance of things hoped for, which is energy. That's the substance of it. Whether it's gas or whether it's electricity, that's the energy. That'll produce the thing you hope for. That unit by itself won't produce anything. It has to have a goal setter. You have to dial the goal in there. And the way you dial the goal in there is set that little number. The way you get the goal set inside you is by speaking and saying some things. Speaking those things in faith. Getting in agreement with what God says. Now whether that unit feels like it or not, when that impulse goes to that unit, you know what happens? it releases that energy that is in there and starts immediately producing the thing you dialed in. Now see, that's the way the heart of man works. You take the Word of God, you speak it, you speak it, you set the goal. The divine energy is in God's Word to cause the heart to bring forth the manifestation of that. Now, even in the summertime, right now, right here in this building, the energy that is bringing forth cool air in this building is the same energy that brings hot air in this building in the wintertime. The thing that changes direction of it is the goal setter. Whether it's hot or cold, depends on the goal that's set. Are you getting this now? If you're not satisfied with the harvest you're getting, check up on the gold you're setting and the seed you're sowing. See? Now that unit won't argue with you, see? It's not going to argue that, no, you don't need hot air, you need cold air, or you don't need cold air, you need hot air. It won't argue with you. It's not designed to decide whether it's right or wrong. Can you see that? Its only design is to produce whatever you, the impulse you send into it. Now, the heart of man, from what the Bible says, is that way. See, we've just kind of taken natural things and so separated them from spiritual things until we wanted to make out like there was no relationship when Jesus and God and the whole Bible keeps bringing them all back together and saying as long as there's... Uh, the earth remaineth, there will be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, day and night, and it will never cease, and that's the way it works. And he keeps talking about sowing. You sow the seed, you reap a harvest. Now, whatsoever man saith, that's what he'll have. Whatsoever man soweth, he'll reap. So, you see, we need to bring these natural things and spiritual things back together, and you can more understand it, because that's the way Jesus did it. Now, I'm going to say it another way. I'm going to say this in many ways, you can't miss it. The soil in your garden does not decide whether it's right or wrong what you plant in it. Now, I know there's people that believe it this way, and we'll not have a falling out if you want to believe it that way, but I'm just telling you the way I see the Bible teaching it, that the soil will produce whatever you plant in it. There's people that believe that the human spirit of the heart of man would not produce anything that's bad if he's born again. Well, you, you've got to question yourself then and wonder how people backslide and how they get off in, 
into, back into sin, you know. Jesus said, A good man out of the good deposit of his heart, he bringeth forth good things. The evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart, he bringeth forth evil things. Well, I'm convinced from what the Bible teaches that even a born-again Christian can put evil things in his heart. Now, what God considers evil is anything that's contrary to the Word of God. That's, that's what he said was evil. That's what he told the children of Israel was evil, the, the report that they brought back and said, we can't go in, there's giants in there. He called it an evil report. You know, why is it an evil report? Because it disagreed with God's Word. Now, the point I was getting to was this. I was a farmer for 30 years before I went into the full-time ministry. And never in all of the years that I farmed did I go out and plant a cotton seed or soybean and have the ground say to me, we're not going to raise soybeans, we're going to raise cucumbers and bananas. But sometimes we've kind of got the idea that it doesn't matter what you sow, doesn't matter what you say, God knows what I meant. You could say, well, you know, I planted radishes or I planted butter beans, but the soil knew what I meant. I meant to plant tomatoes. You're not going to have any tomatoes. I'm sorry to tell you, but it just doesn't work. The soil does not think. The soil does not decide whether it's right or wrong what you plant in it. Its job, its design is to produce, cause to come to you, the information needed to cause what you're saying to come to pass. Whether it's right, whether it's wrong, or whether it's indifferent. Now see, Mark eleven twenty three is not a one-way street. Oh, we wish it was. Some of you students wish it was, but it's not. Jesus just told you how to operate it on the positive side. He didn't want you to know about the negative side. He didn't want you operating in the negative side. Whosoever shall say to the mountain, Be removed, be cast in the sea, doubt not in his heart, believe what he says will come to pass. See, he set the goal on removing the tremendous problem before him. But right on the other hand, it'll work just as fast on the negative side. Jesus did, didn't want you over there. Because some people say, Well, I tell you, this mountain's getting bigger every day. I, I just never get over it. You're right. You're right. See, you're working it on the negative side. See, there's a positive and a negative to all of this. Jesus taught the positive side of it. It'll work just as fast on the negative side. And you prophesy that things are getting worse. We'll never make it. We'll never pay our debts. We'll never get this church going. We'll never do that. We'll never do this or we'll never do that. And see, you're speaking that into the soil. And it'll cause your spirit to search the avenues of God's wisdom, find out how to bring to pass. Now see, that, that unit up, let's go back to the unit. The unit won't decide whether you need heat or cold. It just depends on what you said in that. Now I know we get accused that this is mind over matter, positive thinking. No, this is Bible thinking. This is God's Word. We're declaring to you what God's Word says concerning these things. Well, it's not going to work just because you say it a few times. But it will work. It will work. The confession of God's Word works. Now, I don't know whether I related this or not. I'm, I'm going to say it again, though it needs, if I did, needs repeating. Several years ago, when I got a hold of this, uh, I started confessing that I'm redeemed from the curse, and in the name of Jesus... Uh, I forbid sickness to operate in my body. At the time, I had ulcers. And I'd just be laid up for weeks, or, or for three or four days in a week, you know, and just couldn't do anything. And just hurt, man, I hurt, and drank that nail ox by the bottle. Never did do a whole lot of good, but it, it, if I even thought it'd do any good, I'd drink it, you know. Well, I started confessing. I started confessing and confessing my healing. Now, over a period of time, over about three months, I suppose, uh, it began to get into my spirit, you see. won't happen just because you say it, but saying it is involved in working it. Then over a period of three months, the ulcers left my body. Oh, they tried to come back a few times. The devil tried to get back in. But I just say, no, in the name of Jesus, I've received my healing. 
just stand on it, you know. And uh, I was delivered from that. Then I found out how to operate in this through trial and error. I made some mistakes, but uh, I began to confess that I'm redeemed from the curse, that poison ivy doesn't affect my body in the name of Jesus. Now I used to get poison ivy all over me every time I'd get around it, you know. And I confessed that I did. Well, I started confessing it, and then guess what? I, I went deer hunting and got poison ivy. Well, somebody says, it's not working, is it? Yeah, faith is coming. Faith is coming. I'm setting the goal. Well, I kept confessing it. I kept confessing it. What happened? Got it again. Well, what did you do? I put some calamine lotion on it, got it dried up, kept saying it, kept saying it. Kept confessing it. See, it wasn't conceived in my spirit yet. Faith in the heart is the ability of the heart to conceive God's promise. Once it does, you're going to have a manifestation. It may take a while, but it's going to come. So I continued this for something like a year. And then after about a year, I noticed that uh, it didn't bother me anymore. Now see, the, the corresponding action that I had toward what I believed was that I continued to confess it to say what God said about it, even though all natural circumstances and, and the bumps on my arm and hand said that I was not redeemed from it. I kept saying that I was redeemed from it. Now, there's people that say it's mind over matter. No, it's not. It's faith in God and his word over all matter. So I continued that until it got into my spirit. And then when it got into my spirit, it manifested itself in my physical body. Now, see, if I'd have said, well, I'm going to have full corresponding action toward this that I'm saying and just go sleep in a bed of poison ivy, <laughs> I'd have been in trouble, man. Because, see, I was just getting it programmed and I was just sowing it in my spirit. So, see, I wouldn't have had full corresponding action toward what I was saying until I had the full manifestation. But, you see, now, after a year or so, I, it, it didn't affect my body. And right now, I can have full corresponding action toward it. Poison ivy, in that my skin does not react to it. Now, it took, it took a year. It took about a year to do that. And these things are not going to happen overnight. Confession of God's Word is a process in renewing the mind, causing faith to come, and getting it built inside you until the heart can conceive what you're saying and bring the manifestation of it, either in your physical body and your finances, in every situation of life. This is just the way it works. So uh, right now, I can, I can take my hands and pull poison ivy off of a tree or off, pull the vines off the tree. It doesn't bother me anymore. Now, it's amazing that for years I confessed that it'd get on me, and it got on me. Got exactly what I said. But when I started saying it doesn't get on me, it still got on me for nearly a year. And see, there's people run into this, and they say, well, this stuff doesn't work. Yeah, it's working. Faith is coming. It just takes time. It takes a process. It is a way of life. This is not a fad. This is not something you just start out to try. If you're going to try it, I'll be the first to tell you it's not going to work. Because if I'd been trying it, when I got poison ivy, I'd have said, well, it doesn't work. We can chunk that one. Forget it. But... It really, it really never occurred to me that it wouldn't work because Jesus said it would. See, once you find out it's a principle of the Bible and study it and understand the way to operate in it, then don't back off from it. See, just stay with it and confess it. And that doesn't mean that you don't use any other method, see. Yeah, I used calamine lotion and everything I could to keep the symptoms down until I got the manifestation, see. And, and don't come under, under condemnation with that. Some people get under condemnation if their faith is not developed to where they can just believe God for everything to go away, you know. And they go to a seminar and get under condemnation because they have to take medicine. Well, keep the symptoms down. Operate on the level where you are in your faith until you get developed in it. Well, I can see we have time. You better read the next chapter and, and study your notes. And uh, we'll talk about something a little bit different along the same line, but a little bit different in the, in the next chapter. Uh, session. You see, we're going we're gonna to talk about probably in the next session five or six reasons, maybe seven, why the confession of God's Word works.
So bring your pencil and have them all sharp and we'll get into it. Faith, our faith and confession. Now, I remember in that uh, cartoon that I saw. In fact, we took it and printed it in our newsletter. And uh, it was two guys standing back to back. And uh, one of them had a gun in his hand. He's standing there, and the other one didn't have anything in his hand. He's standing back against him like they're going to walk off and have a duel. And the caption under it was, uh, the other guy standing over here says, uh, Don't you think this faith and confession thing has gone too far, the disagreement about faith and confession? Well, the, the guy that's standing there without a gun in his hand said, uh, Oh, it's all right, I'm confessing he'll miss me. we're we're continuing on the series of faith and confession because you see it makes a difference when you understand faith and confession now you've got people all the time that are running off the ditch on the right hand side of the road you've got some running off the ditch on the left hand side of the road but you see the reason we're staying so long on this series and dealing with these things is because we want you students to get a hold of this and understanding of it because when you understand it, you can apply it better in your lives. Now I want you to open your Bibles with me to the 13th chapter of Matthew. And I'm going to share with you in, in uh, this session seven reasons why the confession of God's Word works for you. Why it should be done. Why you should confess and speak in agreement with the Word of God. See, sometimes people say, well, now, I tell you, this is just too mechanical. You're just trying to force God into something. No, it's God's principles of faith and confession. Confession is a way to possession, and you need to know that. It's not the only way, but it is one of the ways, and it is a Bible way. Now, I want to read you what, uh, first of all, in, in the 13th chapter of Matthew, beginning... At verse 18, it says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he that receives seed by the wayside. Now, of course, you recognize this immediately as being the parable of the sower. But I want you to listen to what Jesus said about it. See, sometimes we read the account in Mark. Now, Mark's account's a little different than this account, see. Mark says, uh, when the seed is sown in the heart, then cometh Satan and taketh away the word that was immediately to take away the word that was sown in the heart. Well, if you, you read that account and don't read this account, you would think that, well, you know, Satan can just steal the word any time he wants to, but he can't. Here it says, he that heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not. Now that's the reason it's easy for Satan to steal the word from some people, because they didn't understand it. Now if you give diligence to the word of God and to, the, to understand God's word, Satan can't steal it from you. Can't be taken from you. In fact, Jesus said this to, to Mary when Martha was concerned about Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, hearing the word, and Jesus said, you're cumbered about many things, but said, she has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So Jesus said to, uh, there that the word that she was receiving wouldn't be taken away from her, and it was because she would understand it when Jesus taught it. So that's why teaching is important. That's why we're doing so much teaching on confession and faith and confession. Now, in this parable, in fact, we dealt with this in the last session uh, over in verse 26 of, of Mark, the fourth chapter, where it says, So is the kingdom of God as if a man cast seed into the ground. Now, number one, under why the confession of God's word works for you, is because it is sowing seeds in the kingdom. You're sowing seed in the heart or in the kingdom of God. And that's what that scripture essentially says in verse 26. So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and he should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, and he doesn't know how. 
Now see, it's not necessary that you completely understand God's method. This is a principle of God. But if you just have faith to do it and be obedient to God's word and do what he said to do, hold fast to your confession of faith, do what the word of God says to do, then it'll work for you. But it helps when you can understand it. Because we just read a scripture here where it says that when he heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh Satan, or the wicked one, and taketh away the word that was sown in his heart. So you students need to take notes. You need to uh, study these things and meditate on them because the more understanding you get of the word of God, the harder it is for Satan to steal it from you. Now, there's sometimes that people grasp the word. In fact, this is in the parable of the sower. They hear it and receive it with gladness. But when affliction and persecution comes because of the word, immediately they're offended. Now, the problem was that they didn't really understand it. You have people that think, well, it's going to happen just because I say it. No, it won't happen just because you say it. But yet, saying it is involved in causing it to happen. Now, I'm going to say that again because I want you to get it. It won't happen just because you confess some things. It won't happen just because you say some things. But saying it is involved in causing it to come to pass. You have to mix faith with God's Word. So, sowing in the kingdom is the number one reason, I would say, that, that the reason that faith works for you, or confession of God's Word works for you. You're sowing seed. See, it says, as if a man should cast the seed into the ground. It's not God doing it. It's the individual that does it. Now, the seed is the word of God. That's established here in this parable. See, the, the sower soweth the word of God. The sower soweth words. Now, it could be even, and we've mentioned this some of the other sessions, it could even be words that is not exactly God's word, but speak in line with the word of God. And then, of course, you could sow the devil's words in your heart if, if you spoke what the devil said. So it's important what you confess. And when we say confess, we're talking about agreeing with God's word when we say confess the word of God, see. We're not talking about confessing sin when we say confess the word of God. We're talking about confessing what God said about the situation. And we need to realize that this is important because God said it and it's an established truth but you see, we have to agree with that. Add our faith to it and speak it. So sowing in the kingdom, that's what we're doing with the word of God. We're taking the promise of God, which is what God has given us, and we speak it, and we speak it, and we speak it, and it becomes a seed that is sown in the heart. Now that's where faith works. Faith works in the heart. Faith won't work in the head. Now, see, in the last session, we got to talking about the relation of the heart of the unit on this building out here that's designed to, to cool and to heat this building, see, and control the temperature in it. Now, that unit by itself is designed to do that one thing, and that is whatever the thermostat says to that unit is what that unit will do, whether you set it on heat or cold. It obeys that thermostat. Now, we liken the thermostat on that unit to the head, you see. The Bible says faith is the substance of things. It is the substance of things hoped for. Well, we hope for the things God has given us, don't we? That's what we should hope for, what God has given us. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So since faith is the substance of those things, of things hoped for, Hope is important, even though it has no substance, you see. There's no substance in hope. There's nothing in hope to cause it to come to pass, but it is very important because it is a goal setter. Now, now we dealt with this, but the thing I wanted to bring out in this session was that that thermostat on the wall could not heat or cool this building by itself. It's impossible to. Now, that's why you need to learn. You students need to learn this, and when you go out teaching it, you need to teach it this way so people can understand that it's not the saying it that causes it to come to pass. That's not the whole working of it. It's not an end in itself. But saying it and speaking it is involved in causing it to come to pass because the saying it and speaking it is setting the goal. 
Hope is a goal setter. Now, without a goal, how would you know when you got there? I mean, if you had no goal set, how would you know when you attained to it? And what route would you take to get there? How long would it take you to get there if you didn't know where you was going? <laughs> so hope's a goal setter. Now, that thermostat on the wall is a goal setter. The heart of that unit won't work without it. Even though it's designed to heat and cool this building, it won't work without it. You have to set a goal. The head is the goal setter. The carnal mind are, are our speaking and saying, see, that's why I said faith works in the heart. It won't work in your head. Now, there's some people trying to get faith to work out of the head. It'll give you a headache, <laughs> quite frankly, because it was not designed. The carnal mind was not designed to operate in the laws of God. Now, now Paul has something to say about this, and I'll, I'll give you the scripture for it in Romans the 8th chapter, where he said the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. Now, the law he's referring to is the law of faith. That's the law he's referring to. The, your, your head won't operate in that law because it wasn't designed to do that. You see, the head, your head is a goal setter. You think with it. And, and you speak some things. What you speak is a product of what you've thought and meditated on. So you see, that's why I say that the thermostat on the wall is a goal setter. It's like your head. It's just a goal setter. And just because you say something doesn't mean it's going to happen. But many of these things would never happen unless saying was involved in it because that's setting the goal. Now, we related this also, and I'd like to review that just a little bit. We related it to the fact that a farmer, when he plants a seed, that seed is his goal, isn't it? I mean, that's what he's after, is more seeds just like that one. More plants just like the one he's planting, see. And uh, then that becomes the goal. So the thing you're saying, whether you're speaking faith about your finances or, or about your physical body, you're setting a goal for the heart of the unit, which is the spirit man down here. And it will come forth and bring forth that and cause it to come into manifestation. But like I said, it won't happen just because you say it. But yet, saying it is involved in working it. I hope, we, I trust we've covered that. Now, now let's go on to another point here. Number two, under why confession of God's word works for you, is that it causes faith to come. See, the setting the goal, the speaking of it, is sowing seeds in the kingdom. See, the kingdom of God is within you. Then the continuing of it. Somebody said, well, you know, if you sow a seed, you don't have to sow it but once. So, but now, you know, a farmer goes out here, and if he's going to sow, if he wants 300 acres of wheat, he doesn't just sow one acre and say, well, I've got the wheat sowed. He's got more to sow, see. So you sow seeds in the kingdom, and you continue to speak what God said about it, your situation, whether it's in the area of physical healing, whether it's in the area of finances, whether it's in the area of spiritual matters. You speak what God said about you, you see. And you speak it. You say it. Confess it. Then it causes faith to come. Now, see, Romans 10, 17, we've covered this in some of the other sessions. But let's say it again. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, it didn't say that faith cometh by having heard. You hear people sometimes, they say, well, I've heard that before. And I said it one time. Well, faith cometh by hearing. You didn't say faith cometh by having heard. Faith cometh by hearing, and 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 hearing. See, it's a continual act. And... Faith cometh. Now, see, faith is the substance of things. Now, remember, hope has no substance. But faith is the substance of things hoped for. Yet, without hope, you wouldn't have anything for faith to give substance to. You set the goal, you plant the seed by speaking the desire, speaking the thing that the, pro the Word of God promised you. 
You get in agreement with it. Let your mouth be in agreement with it. It causes faith to come. So then, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now that being true, let's just reiterate some of the things we've said, lest you forget it. If faith comes by hearing the word of God, faith in God comes by hearing the word of God, then right on the other hand, faith in the devil comes by hearing the words of the devil. So if you're always hearing the words of the devil and wonder why you don't have any faith, that's the reason. You're listening too much to the devil. Now, faith in the devil is called fear. Now, I'm going to say this again, too. We've already said it, but I'm going to say it again. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, of things desired, you see. Then the opposite end of that is that faith is the substance of things desired. Fear is the substance of things not desired. Now, you have only but to read the book of Job and find that out. Job said, the thing I've greatly feared has come upon me. The thing I was afraid of has come unto me. He was, in fact, the Bible says, uh, Job said it out of his own mouth. He said, I, uh, the thing I've greatly feared has come upon me. He didn't just fear, he was highly developed in it. <laughs> See, now, the more highly developed you get in either your faith or your fear, the quicker the manifestation will come. So it's important what you say. Because the words you're speaking is either going to cause faith to come or fear to come. See, words transmit faith and words transmit fear. You need to realize that. Now let's move on to, to another part here. Number three, under why, or the third reason why the confession of God's word is important and why it works for you is because that it renews the mind. Now, how many of you know that your mind didn't get born again just because you got born again? See, the, the Apostle Paul said it this way uh, in, in Romans, the 12th chapter. He says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, these were spirit-filled, tongue-talking, Bible-toting, full of gospel, businessmen, <laughs> you know, and women. And, and he said, you better do something about your mind. See, he was writing this to the church, the Roman church. He said, do something about your mind. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, you renew your mind with the Word of God. Now, confession of God's Word, speaking in agreement with what God says, renews your mind, causes your mind to be renewed to the things that God said. See, you get out there, you students, when you get out of this atmosphere of the, of the Bible school and where people, everybody around you is believing like you do, and you get out there and in the real life situations, then uh, there's not going to be such an anointing to believe as there is right now. <laughs> and man, you think that you're in the wilderness sometimes. Well, if you don't get your mind renewed, then you're going to fall right into the situation. Uh, see, like uh, Peter did when he jumped out of the boat when he wasn't ready for walking on the water. See, he got out of the boat before he was ready. He hadn't learned to not observe circumstances above the word of Jesus. Jesus said, come. There was enough power, there was enough of faith in that one word to cause him to be able to walk on the water. But the problem was his mind was not renewed to the point that he would not observe circumstances. And actually what happened in that situation was that Something that had nothing at all to do with what he was doing caused him to begin to sink. Now, just think about it for a minute. I think we mentioned this in one of the other sessions, but let's say it again. He had never seen anybody walk on the water. With the exception of right then when it was storming. The wind was blowing. They was having a storm. Now, the logical way to think about that, if you thought about it logically, was, you know, I never saw anybody walk on the water before. I guess the only time you walk on the water is while the wind's blowing and it's coming a storm. Wouldn't that be the logical way to look at it? If you had never seen anybody walk on the water any other way except when it was storming, you'd get to thinking, I tell you, I guess you can walk on the water when it's storming. 
but he stepped out of the boat and he's walking on the water. But then he gets to looking at circumstances. And he sees the waves so high and the wind so boisterous. Now what'd that have to do with it? Not a thing in the world. You mean tell me you can walk on the swimming pool if the wind's not blowing? No, didn't have a thing to do with it, did it, see? I mean, if it had had anything to do with it, it should have been on the other side. It should have been him thinking this way. Well, thank God, I guess anybody can walk on the water while it's storming. I just never tried to walk on it while it's storming. I guess everybody could walk on the water while it's storming. <laughs> but you see, it's something that had nothing at all to do with what he's doing caused him, it says, fearing he began to sink. Now see, his mind was not renewed to the Word of God. It was not renewed to the point that he did not observe circumstances. So it's important that your mind gets renewed. And there's only one way to do it, and that is confessing and speaking and saying what God says. Your minds are renewed by the Word of God. Then, number four, under that, we list it this way, it keeps the answer before you. Keeps the answer before you. See, if you're always facing the problem, if you're always speaking the problem, if you're always praying the problem, you know what? You're going to have faith in the problem. I mean, if you're always telling somebody, boy, I got this problem, and you go to the Lord and say, Lord, I got this problem, and, and Lord, I don't know what to do about this problem, and you're telling your neighbor, I tell you, this problem is really a problem. You know what? You really got a problem. <laughs> you really have. Because, you see, all you're seeing is a problem. When you wake up in the morning, you're seeing the problem. When you go to bed at night, you're thinking and seeing the problem. You eat, sleep, and drink the problem. Now, now people will say to you like this when you begin to renew your mind and when you begin to keep the answer before you by confessing the Word of God, they'll say, oh, you're, you're just ignoring the problem. That's what you're doing. No, no, I'm not ignoring it. I'm doing something about it. See, now, now Philippians, the fourth chapter, the Apostle Paul said, uh, with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. With thanksgiving. See, with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. And uh, then the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, in other words, he said, now this will wrap the whole thing up that we're talking about. He said, whatsoever things are good, pure, perfect, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, see, when you get accused of why you're just ignoring the problem, why well, just quote this scripture to them, what Paul said, see. He said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are good, pure, perfect, lovely, and of good report, well, think on these things. See, if you're going to have... Now, everybody wants to have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Everybody wants that. But they don't want to do what the Bible says to do to get it. They want a shortcut, see. They want to have the peace of God, but they want to go about confessing the problem, proclaiming the problem, praying the problem. And you know it's totally unscriptural to pray the problem. Now, if you don't know that, you need to learn it quick. Because you're going to be in trouble if you don't. Because if you pray the problem day in and day out, the more you pray the problem, the more you say the problem. The more you say the problem, the more you pray the problem, the more faith you'll have in the problem. Because faith cometh by hearing. Can you see that? No, we're not ignoring the problem when we go this route. We're doing something about the problem. We're keeping the answer before us. You will never solve a problem by dwelling on the problem itself. You have to get off the problem and get over on the answer. God's Word is the answer to every situation. So confessing God's Word keeps the answer before you. And as long as you do that, your attitude will change. You'll become a different person. See, if, if every time you open your eyes, all you see is the problem right before you. You think the problem, you, you believe the problem, you talk the problem, and <laughs> you end up being the problem. <laughs> Sometimes the problem is one inch below your nose. It's your mouth. 
And the quicker you realize that, the better off you'll be. See. Now, you keep the answer. See Mark 11, 20, 23 and, and 24 talks about that. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. What things? Them things you prayed. The things that you prayed, see. That's what he's talking about. So if you're praying the problem, then he says you're going to have the things you prayed. Now see, Jesus said this, and I don't want to get over into that very far, but I do just want to say this and just point it out to you, because sometimes people don't realize, Jesus said in the sixth chapter of Matthew, he said, your heavenly Father already knows what you have need of before you ask him. In other words, you're not required to pray the problem, tell God the problem. He already knows the problem. What he wants you to do is tell him the answer. Now God said, call me to remembrance what I've said. Remind me of my word. Now, that doesn't mean God's forgetful. It's not for his benefit you're doing it. It's for your benefit. <laughs> because faith cometh by hearing. It's, it's not going to make God's faith stronger because he heard it. It's going to make your faith stronger. See? So if you'll pray the answer, your faith will grow while you pray. If you pray the problem, fear will grow while you pray. Now, I'm going to say that again. Somebody wrote me a letter and said, we're going to name you Say It Again Caps. <laughs> well, that's all right. Because some things need to be said more than once. If you pray the Word of God and pray the answer, your faith will grow while you're praying. If you're praying the problem and your troubles, your fears will grow while you're praying. Some Christians destroy their faith by their praying. Now, that's not the will of God. That's not the direction of God. That's not what prayer is for, <laughs> to destroy your faith. Prayer is to pray the answer, you see. What's there things you desire? I don't desire the problem, so I don't pray the problem. Now, let, let me just throw this in there while we're there. I, I traveled the religious road of praying for 20 years of my Christian experience in life. Seldom ever got a prayer answer. If I did, it was just a faith accident. You know, but now you know someone stated this way, and I think it's a good illustration. You know, I don't know what it is. What is it, 30, 35 miles from from Dallas to Fort Worth? Well, you know, if you started out towards Fort Worth and you stayed on that <coughs> freeway out there for three years and didn't get there, <coughs> you'd figure out after a while I'm on the wrong road. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't take you three years, surely, to figure that out. But here I was, traveled that religious road of praying for 20 years. Seldom ever got a prayer answer. Never did get to where I But when I found out that I was supposed to pray the answer instead of the problem, I got more prayers answered in two weeks than I got answered in the previous 20 years, all put together. <clears throat> now... Now, see, that'll, that'll help you because uh, it'll save you 20 years of your life that <laughs> you don't have to go that route, see. And uh, pray the problem. I mean, don't pray the problem. Raise that off the table. <laughs> don't pray the problem. Pray the answer. <laughs> Praying the problem is the problem. You see, pray the answer. That's God's will. Now, another thing that God said about this, he says, my word won't return to me void. Well, now, who's going to return his word to him? See, he's expecting you to do that. Now, now there, there's, you see, when you analyze what God said, there's some real truth in that and some real meaning into it and there's some real reason to it. If you return God's word to him while you're doing it, it'll cause your faith to grow. It'll renew your mind and it'll plant seeds in the kingdom. It'll do all these things that we're talking about here. So, see, God's not trying to make it hard on you when he says these things in the word of God. He's trying to make it easy for you. Then uh, number, what are we on? Number five? Number five, it'll change your heart. The confession of God's word will change your heart. Now, I want you to open your Bibles to Proverbs there because there's Proverbs, the fourth chapter. I want to read the passage of Scripture. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture, but I want you to see it. Verse 20, my son, attend to my words, incline thine ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. 
Now, the way you get the word in your heart is you speak it in there. See, we're in Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verse 21 here. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart, for their life to those that find them, their health, are medicine to all their flesh. God's word will heal you. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, or one translation says the forces of life. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the forces of life. That's where the, the production comes from, you see. So that's why it's important to uh, change your heart because our, our heart gets filled with thorns and with rocks. Now see, we talk about sowing seeds in the kingdom. Did you realize that the soil, in which the Bible says the heart of man is soil, it's a production center, that a soil will try as hard to make a rock produce as it will a seed. It does the same thing to a rock that it does to a seed, but the rock won't produce because there's no life in it. That's why you have to get the rocks out of your heart. That's why the parable of the sower, he said, get the, you know, the, that that was sown on stony ground. Didn't produce. It'll take just as much time, that soil will, trying to make a rock produce as it will a seed, but there's no life in the seed. But the word of God is the incorruptible seed. So you sow the word in there, get the stones out. <clears throat> That's what we're doing with this teaching. We're trying to get some of the stones out so this word can take root in you, you see. Now, number six, it sets the law of faith in motion. See, there's a law involved in this thing. There's a law of faith. Paul said, where is boasting then? It is excluded. But what law? The law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So, faith is a law, and this is the law that, that the Apostle Paul is speaking of in Romans, the eighth chapter that we mentioned a while ago, where he said, the carnal mind is enmity against God. That means irreconcilable hostility. Now, that's a strong word. It can't be reconciled to the law of God. You cannot believe with your head what you can believe with your heart. That's what he's saying. You can't believe that you can speak to a mountain and it move and be cast into the sea with your head. That's the reason a lot of people don't ever get into this. They, they, they try to get it in their head. It won't work in your head. It only works in the heart. You can believe things with the spirit man, with the heart, that you can't even begin to believe with your head. But you can renew your mind and get to where your head won't fight you over it all the time. See, and that's what we're, what we're talking about. That's the reason we're teaching on this. Get your mind renewed. Sets the law of faith in motion. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 13, makes this statement quoting from an Old Testament scripture, see. He says, As it is written, we, believe, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, we believe, I believe, and therefore speak. He said, we also believe and therefore speak. Now that's the way it works. What you believe, you speak. And what you speak, you'll believe it stronger every time you speak it. See, it causes faith to come. So Paul is, is saying this here. You're really setting this law in motion, this spirit of faith and this law of faith. Then Mark 11, 23 and 24, see, falls right in line with that. And then, of course, uh, Luke, the 17th chapter, verses 5 and 6, where Jesus said, if you had faith as a seed, you would say unto the mountain, or to the sycamine tree, be plucked up by the root, be planted in the sea. And he said, it would obey you. So all of these things is telling you how the law, it, it sets the law of faith in motion. No, I'll be the first to tell you, it's not going to happen just because you say something. But saying it is involved in putting it in motion. See, sometimes people get the idea, well, that confession stuff is just too mechanical. It's, it's just trying, they're just trying to make God do something. No, no, we're just speaking what God said in agreement with it so that it'll change the heart, cause it'll cause faith to come, it'll renew the mind, it'll keep the answer before you, it'll change your heart, set the law of faith in motion. That's why we do it. That's why we speak it. That's why we should speak God's Word. Even though when outward circumstances says it's not true in the natural. See, there's some things that's true in the Word of God that should be true in our lives. And as far as God's concerned, it's that way. I mean, he doesn't have to do a thing in the world to cause it to come into line with the Word of God, but it's a matter of us setting these things in motion. And you've got to start somewhere, see. Sometimes people say, well, where do I start? You have to start where you are. 
See, don't ever try to start up there where somebody else is. Now, this is where more people get in trouble with the faith message and the confession message, is trying to start where they're not. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. I think I've said it many times, but it bears repeating. You can't build a third story on a vacant lot. <laughs> You've got to start where you are. So you may start by confessing. You'll get a parking place when you go to town, you know. You won't have to walk in the rain to the store, you know. So start where you are. Develop yourself in the small things. Don't reach out and try to confess a million dollars or, or something when, you, when you're not developed to that, see. You've got to start where you are. It'll work just, and, it, and you'll get developed in it just as well in the small things as you will in the big things. And, and you finally get to where you can believe God for bigger things. You see, and confess and find out what, what works, what makes it work, and what will short it out. See, you can make some confessions that sound good, but do them in fear. There's people that confess God's Word in fear. It sounds good. They're saying the right things, but they're doing it in fear, see. It has to be done in faith. That's why that you have to continue to do it. Some things that you speak, you won't believe them when you say them. You know it's true in the Bible. You know the Bible's true, but it's not true in you. But if you speak it, if you confess it, if you proclaim it long enough, you'll go to believe in it. See, what you speak, you believe. Now, let's go on to the, to the last but not least, so we can wrap this up. Number seven is that it puts the angels to work for you. Now, many people have never realized this, but the angels are listening to the words you speak. The Bible says that, that the angels, uh, that the law was given by the disposition of angels. In other words, they were there when the law was given. The angels were involved in it. Now, let's turn to, to uh, Hebrews 11, uh, not the 11th chapter. Hebrews, the second chapter. Hebrews chapter... Well, no, let's, let's back up to the first chapter. That's where it is. <laughs> I usually go into the second chapter with this when I teach about angels, but we're not going that route with it in this session, so let's stop off there in the latter two verses, you see, of, of Hebrews 1. It said, But which of the angels... To which of the angels said he in time sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Now this scripture tells you that the angels are ministering spirits. They're sent here to minister for those who are heirs of salvation. And thank God that's us. If you're an heir of salvation, then they're here to minister for you. Supernatural beings, angels, the ministering spirits of God, they're here to minister for you. Now go with me over to Hebrew, uh, not Hebrews, <laughs> Revelations, the 22nd chapter. And let's notice what the Apostle John said. We'll read from verse, verse 8 and 9 of Revelations 22. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then, then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. Now this angel told John, said, Man, don't worship me, I'm your servant. And you missed a good place to shout. <laughs> See, we haven't realized some things about angels this time we did that they are our fellow servants. They're servants of ours. One translation said, a fellow slave of yours am I. And of thy brethren the prophets, well, you may say, well, I'm not a prophet, but this will get you, and of them that keep the sayings of this book. So if you're keeping the sayings of this book, then the angels are servants, your servants. Now, you can't just go around telling angels to do this and do that and change oil in my car and <laughs> do this. <laughs> now, you ought not have to say these things, but you do, see. Because any truth you come up with, somebody's going to carry it too far if you don't just 
hit every angle of it. But yet, angels are listening to what you say. Because what you say has a tremendous effect on what they do. See, we thought, well, I, I don't know, I guess God just tells all the angels what to do. But he's not telling them all what to do. Now, God does send messages by angels from time to time, and they're used to, they're called messengers. But yet, there's something more powerful in this. Over in Psalms 103, let's get to that verse 19 and 20. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, but his kingdom ruleth over all. Now notice, the kingdom ruleth over all. Where is the kingdom? It's inside you. He rules in the heavens, but his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Now the angels, he said, are doing his commandments. What is considered the commandments of God? David said, uh, God's word is his statute, is his commandments. See, he called it commands, called the word of God commandments. Now Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, A man will have whatsoever he saith, if he believe and doubt not in his heart, but believe what he says will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now the angels know that. They know what the Word of God said. It seems that the angels are sent in the earth to minister for us and to make sure that God's Word comes to pass, what God's Word says. So they are listening to what you say because what you say many times gives them an assignment for them to work on. If you're saying what God said, then you've assigned an angel are, are many angels to go and to cause that to come into manifestation. Now, now look at it right here. It says, Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Now notice, it, they hearken to the voice of God's word. Now did you notice that this is the word of God? This is God's word. But you can hold it up to this microphone and it won't say a word. It has no voice. Now, angels hearken to the voice, or we could say the sound of God's Word. Now you begin to get a hold of it, aren't you? With this book here, there is no sound to it. But they hearken to the sound of God's Word. And when they, see, in this book, it's, it, there's just not a whole lot it's doing. But now, if I, if I can figure out a hit, how to give God's voice give God's word voice, then the angels will hearken to what I said because it is what God said. So in the scriptures, in the scriptures it says, Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, so bountifully and you'll reap bountifully. Well, that's in the Bible, all right, but you can lay that on your billfold and it won't cause it to change. But now if you give voice to that and begin to speak it and confess it, then the angels that are standing by you daily listening to what you say, it becomes their assignment because they hearken to the voice of God's Word. And it becomes an assignment for them to see that it comes to pass. God's Word says a man will have what he says if he believes and doubt not in his heart. Now if you believe and doubt not in your heart, then the angels are assigned to see that that comes to pass. Now it may take weeks, it may take months, it might even take years, but you just rest assured that it's working. This is what God said. They hearken to the voice of God's word. So when I begin to say, thank God I'm redeemed from the curse of the law, I'm delivered from the authority of darkness in the name of Jesus, I'm blessed coming in, going out in the basket in the store, no weapon formed against me will prosper, but thank God whatever I do will prosper because I'm like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I've just given voice to God's word and the angels have just left here right now going to see that that comes to pass. They'll do it. They'll do it. They'll do it. But you see, then there'll be somebody say, well, I just don't believe that. Well, just go on confessing those old negative things and see what happens to you. <laughs> no, don't do that either. Get your mind renewed. Get your heart changed. Keep the answer before you. Cause the angels, you see, you can, you can influence angels by speaking the Word of God. See, I teach this sometimes, and I call, call it how to, how to win battles, be successful, and influence angels. <laughs> now, 
I can see that we're out of time. Read the next chapter in the book. Study your notes and, and we're going to hook up and, and go with the next session and we're going to talk about some things in a little different light, see. But whatever you do, confess the Word of God. Don't, don't get turned off because somebody shipwrecked on it. Just act according to the Word of God. And we talked about uh, why the confession of God's Word worked. We went into seven reasons why the confession of the Word of God affects you, and it not only affects you, it influences angels and gets them to minister for you. But now, in this session, we want to go into this. We'll, we'll get into some other things, too. But we want to talk, first of all, about how to put confession to work for you. See, I know sometimes when you tell people, well, just confess the Word of God. Well, you know, people get all kinds of ideas about what you're talking about. Sometimes they think that you mean to go down to the banker and read scriptures or confess the scriptures to the banker. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about confessing it, saying it, where you can hear yourself say it. It's not up to the banker to hear it. It's not up to your neighbor to hear it. But God wants you to hear it. You see, he said, return my word to me or remind me, call me to remembrance of what I've said. Well, it wasn't that God forgot about it. He, he wants you not to forget about it. It keeps the answer before you, and it does all of these seven things that we mentioned in the other session. Now, I, I want us to go into uh, how to get this set up in your life and how to, uh, well, discipline yourself to confess God's Word. Now, God's not trying to make it hard on us. He wasn't trying to make it hard on us. On Joshua, when he said, Joshua, don't let the book of the law depart out of your mouth, but meditate therein day and night. Observe to do all that's written therein. In other words, speak it, meditate on it. Then he said, thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. See, he said, when you make your way prosperous, then you will do wisely. One translation says this way, you'll do wisely in all the affairs of life. In other words, once you've made your way prosperous, then you will do wisely also. Now this is one of the contentions that, that come against this, uh, or the prosperity message is they say, well, prosperity will ruin you. Prosperity destroys people. Well, the Bible says prosperity will destroy a fool. But if you go by God's method, see, and confess the word of God, then he says, when you make your way prosperous, then you will do wisely in all the affairs of life. So it didn't sound like it's going to ruin you, did it? Sound to me like it would help you. Now, I've mentioned this before. I want to mention it again. You see, when you're confessing the Word of God and the things God said, you're really setting gold. What you're saying is setting a gold and, and planting it in the, uh, the seed, in the heart, or in the soil. And if you don't know where you're going, how would you know when you got there? How long would it take you to get there? So as we confess God's word, we establish some of these things. Now I want to use from, from this little booklet, God's Creative Power Work for You. This is a little book that you can put in your pocket. It's not just a book you read. This is a workbook. And when it opens, it opens right to where it's stapled, and it says, uh, Gospel Capsules. Confess these, you see, to defeat worry and fear. Confess these three times a day are as many times as necessary. Now, the way this book got started, or the way we put this book in print, was that uh, the Lord told me to start confessing what God said about me. He said, uh, you've been confessing what the devil said, and most Christians do that. Uh, he said, start saying what I said about you. So I took a piece of paper and just wrote down some confessions on it, and I was farming at the time, and I would go out and get on the turn row back to the back side of the farm and just walk up and down the turn row and say what God said about me. Speak it out loud, see. Now, sometimes people get this book and they'll just read it. Reading it's not the answer to it. It's the confessing of it aloud where you can hear your voice. You see, faith cometh by hearing. You're going to have to hear it. Faith doesn't come by reading. Now, we've assumed that it did, but it doesn't. It does not come. The Bible didn't say that faith come by reading. It said faith cometh by hearing the Word of God. So I, I did this for months and months, and it totally changed my life. 
I was probably one of the most negative people you ever met uh, at that time. But God's Word will change you. And uh, I wanted to just bring this in, and we'll go through some of these. We'll not maybe go through all of them, but I want to show you how to discipline yourself to say what God said about you. I mean, you may feel like it's the biggest lie that you ever let out of your mouth when you say some of these things, but it's what God said. See, these, all of these confessions, we'll not have time to stop and tell you all of the scriptures that are based on it, but it'll be, it's, it's in your uh, study book. Uh, but we could tell you, see, we could go in and take hours and go through every scripture there and show you that this is biblically sound. It's not something that we've just, you know, made up and trying to, to uh, get you to think more of yourself more highly than you ought to think, see. But we should think the way God thinks about us. See, I like what Paul said. He said, what if some did not believe? Would it make the faith of God without effect? He said, no, let God be true and every man a liar. Well, there's some people that don't believe these things, see. And, and you may look out at your situation and your circumstance and say, well, I just don't believe that my needs are met according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Well, whether you believe it or whether you don't believe it, God's word said it if you're obedient to the word of God, so we ought to just line up with what God said. See, it won't happen just because it's in the Bible. It happens when we get in agreement with what God said. Now, these confessions are not something that is just cut and dried. In other words, you don't have to just take this and say, well, that's the only thing you can confess because you tailor make your confessions to whatever you desire and the direction the Lord directs you in the Bible. This is just an uh, example of it. You can use it in different manners. But let's, let's begin here. I am the body of Christ and Satan has no power over me. I overcome evil with good, you see. Now, see, that's all based on Scripture. I am, of, I am the body of Christ. Paul said that. Now you are the body of Christ. You're the only body that Christ has on the earth today. So confess that. You see, you are the body of Christ. If you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, you don't realize what that'll do to your spirit, see. It'll do something for your mind, too. It's renewing your mind. And I am of God and have overcome the wicked one, Satan, for greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, Lord, your word and your spirit, they comfort me. See, you can, you can word this to where it's a prayer or a confession or a confession prayer, <laughs> however you want to do it. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, Lord, your word and your spirit, they comfort me. You, it's hard to imagine what effect this has on the human spirit until you confess it three or four weeks every day, every day, every day, every day. I'm far from oppression and fear does not come nigh me. Somebody said, yeah, but uh, I'm not far from oppression and fear, I'm always afraid. Well, that's the reason you need to confess this. Because you see, this is what God said about you. That's a direct quote, almost a direct quote from Isaiah 54, 14. He says, Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear. Now see, oppression brings fear, or fear brings oppression. So the confession is that I am far from oppression, and fear does not come nigh me. Now, a person that is in fear and, and has oppression, they're going to think and their religious mind's going to tell them, well, it's not true, I'm lying. But now listen, this is what God said. You know, there's a scripture that says, lie not against the truth. I, I don't even remember at this point where it was, but I remember somebody mentioned it the other day. And, and it's the first time I'd ever thought of it along this line. And they mentioned the fact that there are some facts, all right, about your life, maybe. But when you're confessing facts about your life. See, it might be true that you're fearful. It might be true that you're under oppression. That may be a fact in your life, but don't lie against the truth. This is the truth. God says you are far from oppression. God said it, see. Now, God's word is truth. There's a difference in a fact and a truth. See, there's some lying vanities 
And I believe it was uh, Jonah that said, uh, if we observe lying vanities, you see, we forsake. How did he say it? Forsake God's mercy or something like that? <laughs> it escaped me there for a minute. But anyway, you look at what Jonah said about it. Now, so confess I am far from oppression. Fear does not come nigh me. Now, somebody said, you'd just be lying and say that if you was fearful. No, no. I'm, I'm speaking the truth. That is truth. It may not be true in my life, but that's the reason I'm saying it. I'm calling that. See, this is a method of calling things that are not. You call the thing that's not. And we're going to get into that when we get through this. We're going to go right into how to call things that are not. And that's really what confession is doing. It's calling the thing that's not. No weapon formed against me shall prosper, for my righteousness is of the Lord. And whatever I do will prosper, for I'm like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now, you may feel like that's the furthest thing from the truth, but it is the truth. It may be that the fact in your life does not line up with that, but that's the, all the more reason you ought to confess it. Because God said it, see. I'm delivered from the evils of this present world, for it is the will of God concerning me. Now, that is the will of God concerning you. That's what the Bible says. Galatians, the, the first chapter, verse 4. He says that Jesus uh, delivered us, came to deliver us from the evils of this present world. Well, it had to be the will of God if that's what he did, see. No evil will befall me, neither shall any plague come nigh my dwelling. For the Lord has given his angels charge over me. They keep me in all my ways, and my pathway is life, and there is no death. Now, see, sometimes people get offended that they say, oh, you're saying there is no death. I'm just quoting the Bible. That's a direct quote from Proverbs 12, 28. With the righteousness there is life, and there is no death. There's no spiritual death. Now, we're not talking about you're not going to die physically eventually if Jesus tarries long enough, see. But this is what God said about you. No evil will befall me. See, that's from Psalm 91. See, these things are in the Scripture, but these things are not going to happen to you just because they're in the Scripture. See, we have to make it valid in our own lives. And that's simply what God told Joshua to do. Don't let the Word or the book of the law, which was the Word of God that they had in that day, he said, don't let it depart out of your mouth. In other words, keep saying it, speak in line with it, you see. So that's, that's what we're doing here. This is the way you put confession to work for you. See, we found out why it works. This is how to put it to work for you. You confess it when you feel like the very opposite. In fact, that's the time you need to confess it the most. I am a doer of God's word, the word of God, and I'm blessed in my deeds. I take the shield of faith and I quench every fiery dart of the wicked one that comes against me. See, you take the shield of faith. Now, some people, I think, take the shield of doubt and quench all the blessings of God. You can do that. See, that's the opposite end of this truth. You can take the shield of doubt and just quench every blessing. But take the shield of faith and quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Somebody said, how could I say that? they all get to me. That's all the more the reason you ought to say it. Because you're calling this thing in the manifestation. Then Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease germ, every virus that touches this body dies instantly in Jesus' name. <laughs> Somebody said, how in the world can you say that? Well, it's easy. Just open your mouth and begin. Well, yeah, but, but I just don't understand what scriptural basis you have. Well, Mark eleven twenty three 23 says you can have what you say if you believe and doubt not in your heart. So if I can have what I say, why not say what I need to have? See, it's based on the scripture. Every organ, every tissue of my body functions in the perfection to which God created it to function. I forbid, and see, some people take offense at that. Why, you're just trying to be God. No, no. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You can bind the principalities, the powers, and the rulers of the darkness. And you can bind these things. So I just forbid any malfunction of this body in the name of Jesus. 
Somebody said, but what if you're already sick? Just keep saying it anyway. Confess God's word in the face of every circumstance. I am submitted to God and the devil flees from me because I resist him. Now see, that's based on James 4, 7. Now that's what God said about it. Now you may not feel like the devil fleeing, fleeing from you. You may think he's not. But the word says he is. If you get in line with it and confess it and confess it and confess it until your mind is renewed and your heart is changed, you'll wake up someday and when you say, Satan, I resist you in the name of Jesus, then you'll think, whoo, boy, he did, didn't he? <laughs> I remember the day it happened to me. I thought, glory to God, there is power in that. But see, it was weeks and months after I started confessing it. It's not going to happen overnight. See, this is a process. Just speaking what God said. Now, do you realize that this is, all, this is what Jesus did to defeat Satan? He'd just speak what God said on the Mount of Temptation. That's all he'd say. He'd just say what God said, and he defeated Satan with that. In fact, he shook his kingdom beyond repair. Satan hadn't been able to get it back together, and if you get a hold of this, he won't get, anything, he won't get it together against you either. You have the authority to declare these things because they're in the Word of God. For poverty, Father, you've given me wealth. For sickness, you've given me health. For death, you've given me eternal life. Well, you might be sick and poor and on food stamps, but confess it anyway. It's what God's Word says about you. It is true unto me according to the Word of God. It is true unto me according to the Word of God. That's from Psalms 119, verse 25. I have given and it is given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Men given to my bosom. Well, now, see, if you haven't, this is a conditional promise. If you haven't given, then that won't work for you. <laughs> You're going to have to be a giver to get that one to work for you. There's several of them that are that way. There is no lack. My God supplieth all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Well, there may be lack all around you. But you see, you confess what God said about you. You proclaim that. Spirit of truth abides in me, teaches me all things, guides me into all truths. Therefore, I have perfect knowledge of every situation, every circumstance of life. Wisdom of God is formed within me. I do follow the good shepherd. I know his voice, the voice of a stranger I will not follow. I'm filled with the knowledge of the Lord's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I have put off the old man, put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created me. I have received the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of my understanding being enlightened that I am not conformed to this world, but I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm increasing in the knowledge of God. I'm strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. I'm delivered from the authority of darkness. I'm translated into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm born of God and have world overcoming faith residing on the inside of me, for greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. I will do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The Lord is the strength of my life. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keeps my heart and mind through Christ Jesus. And the things that are good, pure, perfect, lovely, and of good report, I think on these things. I let no corrupt communication proceed out of my mouth, but that which is good to the edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. And I grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby I'm sealed unto the day of redemption. I speak the truth of God's word in love and grow up into the Lord Jesus in all things. No man will take me out of his hand. God is on my side. God is in me now. Who can be against me? He's given unto me all things that pertain to life and godliness. Therefore, I'm a partaker of the divine nature. I'm a believer. And these signs follow me in the name of Jesus. I cast out demons. I speak with new tongues. I lay hands on the sick and they recover. Jesus gave me authority to use his name. That which I bind on earth is bound in heaven. That which I loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Therefore, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. I bind and cast down spiritual wickedness in high places. I render them harmless and ineffective against me, against my business, against my ministry, against my property, against my family. And in the name of Jesus, I loose the spirit of the living God to minister accurately the wisdom and knowledge and understanding that I need to deal wisely in all the affairs of life. I am complete in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of all principality, power, might, and dominion, and ever named that is named. Glory to God. <laughs> now, if that won't prime your pump, the well has gone dry. <laughs> I mean to tell you. 
Now, see, you got some benefit out of that, but not near the benefits you get out of it if you would speak it yourself. Just walk up and down, get in your bedroom, walk up and down and say it out loud. Don't whisper it, don't read it. Just read it, you know, uh, to yourself. Read it out loud, speak it out loud. Now, we want to talk about calling things that are not. You see, we've only got one more session to finish this thing up after this one. And I want us to show you the Bible principle that actually confession is operating in and calling things that are not. You see, this is a Bible principle. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want to read from verse 26 and 27. Well, 20, 26 through 28. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, neither many mighty, nor many noble are called, but God has chosen. Now notice, it was God that chose this. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Now see this, some of you didn't even know that scripture's in the Bible, even though you've read it many times. Notice what he said. God chose the method, this method, of using things that are not. Now that means not manifest, things that you can't see with the natural eye. To bring to naught, you know what naught means? Zero. Reduce to nothing the things that are manifest. Now see, this is a Bible principle. God chose this. I didn't choose it until after God chose it. And he says God chose this method. Now God could have done it any way he wanted to, but he chose to do it this way. He chose to use things that are not manifest, things that you can't see, feel, taste, smell, or hear in the natural realm to bring to naught the things that are manifest in the natural realm that you don't desire and that are not according to the Word of God. You see, if you've got a problem and you can see it, then it's in the natural realm, and as long as you can see it and it's in the natural realm, you can take your faith in the Word of God and change it. That's what the Apostle Paul uh, begins to reveal in, in these things. And uh, going over to the second chapter, I mean Second Corinthians, uh, the fourth chapter, let's read from uh, verse 17 down through verse 18. Well, we'd do it an injustice unless we read verse 13. Let's read it. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Now verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, while we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. Now you students need to get a hold of this, because you see, it's easy to believe God when you're in the atmosphere of a Bible school, but when you get out there and begin to see all of the problems and situations that you're facing in life. You're going to have to learn to look at the unseen. The unseen realm is the powerful realm. While we look not at things that are seen, but at things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now here's the principle that God has ordained. This is the principle that God used all through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It is the principle that Jesus used in all of his ministry, and it is the principle of calling things that are not as though they were. Now you see God doing this. And in the fourth chapter of Romans, you find that God said of Abraham, uh, Paul was referring to it in verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee the father of many nations, before whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not, as though they were. Notice, he called the things that were not, that be not, as though they were. Now remember that. Remember the sequence of that. God calls things that are not manifest, 
as though they were manifest. Now, that's God's method. Now, you see, you, you compare this with what Paul said here. God has chosen the things that are not to bring to naught things that are. That's God's method. You call things that are not. You call for eternal forces. Now, you see, he said the things which are not seen are eternal. So you call for the eternal forces of faith and of the Word of God. You call for these things, call into manifestation the thing that is not, and when you do, it will do away with what is. See, Paul said, overcome evil with good. That's what he's talking about doing. Now, when you start talking about calling things that are not, sometimes people get the idea that you're talking about denying what exists. Now, you need to get a hold of this because there's a lot of people, when they get turned on to faith and the confession, they deny things that exist. Confession is not denying what exists. It is calling things that are not. Now, there's a difference in calling things that are not and calling things that are as though they're not. Now, that's what a lot of people do. And you, you students need to take some notes on this and write this down because sometimes if you say it real fast, people say, why, you're just saying the same thing. No, we're saying the very opposite thing. God's method, according to Romans, the fourth chapter, verse 17 and, and 18 there, is that he calls things that are not as though they were. In other words, he calls them into manifestation. By doing that, he nullifies what exists. The problem exists. You don't deny that the problem exists. You don't deny that you're sick if you're sick. You just don't go around confessing you're sick all the time because that'll cause you to have faith in sickness. And uh, people misunderstand that sometimes. And they think, well, uh, if I'm sick, I'm just going to say I'm not sick. Well, that's not going to make you not sick just because you say you're not sick. In fact, it might cause you to lie. See, there's a difference in a lie and a confession. Confession is a method of calling things that are not as though they were. So when I confess, if I'm sick and I confess, thank God I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus, I'm delivered from the authority of darkness, I'm redeemed from the curse of the law, I'm calling my body well and healthy in Jesus' name. I'm not denying sickness. I'm just denying it the right to exist in my body. What I'm doing is calling for health and healing in my body. That's God's method. That's God's method. Now, you get criticized for it, sure. But that's all right. As long as I'm doing what God said, they can go ahead and criticize me. Now, if I'm, if I'm like someone said, well, now, you're just trying to act like God. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'd rather act like God than the devil. If I'm acting like God, saying what God said about me, then those that are saying what the devil said are acting like the devil. Hmm? Now, you may not like that, but it's true anyway. It'll make some mad and some glad, but it's the truth. If you're always quoting what the devil said and saying what is, then you're falling right in line with the devil. You're acting like the devil. That's the way the devil says it. He, he says things out. He'll tell you why you're sick, you're sick, you're sick. Why, sure, you're sick, and you're going to die. You're never going to get any better. And you go out just saying the same thing. Well, I guess I'll go to my grave in the wheelchair. See? Well, you're just falling in line with the devil. See, when there was no hope, Abraham believed in hope. He went to the Word of God and got him some hope. And then he just said what God said. He said, I'm the father of many nations. See, God tricked him into that, really. See, God named him to where he had to say, my name's Abraham. Abraham meant father of nations. And faith cometh by what? Hearing the Word of God. That was the Word of God concerning Abraham. You're the father of nations. But he wasn't the father of nations at that point. But God said he was. What was God doing? He was just calling it into manifestation. And then he taught Abraham how to do it by renaming him. And then Abraham went about saying just what God said, and he called it into manifestation. Now you see another incident in the Bible where that uh, God told Zacharias, we've heard your prayer, and, uh, and uh, sent an angel down there and told him that. And said, your prayer is going to be answered. Your wife's going to have a child. And he said, now I'll paraphrase it. He said, how do I know you're telling the truth? You're going to have to give me a sign. And that angel said, yeah, I'll give you a sign, all right. You won't be able to speak until the day it comes to pass. Now, see how God dealt with one individual and another individual? Here's a man that's walking in doubt concerning what God said to him, and he said, you better shut his mouth up or it'll never work. 
Now, you need to learn that. There's times to be silent and there's times to speak. So he stopped him from talking for nine months. But for Abraham, he just renamed him and got him to say in what God said. See, Zacharias wouldn't say what God said. He wanted a sign. I'll tell you what you'll find out. Jesus never would preach to people that wanted signs. He went across the lake one time and met a bunch of people said, Show us a sign. Never preached one sermon. Got right back in the boat and left. Don't follow signs. <laughs> now, let's, let's look at this. He said he has chosen this method. God chose this method. I didn't choose it until after God chose it. Now, let me show you where people miss it. And let me show you the reason for it. Somebody says, well, I'm just going to deny that I'm sick. I'm saying I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. Or maybe they're saying I don't have uh, lung disease, I don't have emphysema, I don't have emphysema. If you could get rid of it that way by denying it, you might die with cancer. That's not the answer. See, if you call that in for manifestation, you might still have some other disease. But see, God's method is to call the thing that's not. Not to deny what he is. You don't call things that are as though they're not. You call the thing that is not manifest as though it were manifest. And if you were going to do that concerning sickness, you'd say, thank God the Bible says that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. I'm redeemed from the curse of the law, and the curse of the law was sickness, poverty, sickness, and spiritual death. And in the name of Jesus, 1 Peter 2.24 said I was healed by the stripes, and I'm confessing these things and saying them in the name of Jesus. And it's causing faith to come. So you're calling, and I'm calling my body well. Body, are you listening to me? I'm telling you, you're well in the name of Jesus. And somebody said, well, I know you're just lying because you're hurting. I may be hurting, but I'm calling for the thing that's not manifest. They said, well, how can you say that your body is well when you're sick? That's the, all the more the reason you ought to say it. You're calling for the thing that's not. You're calling it into manifestation. I'm not trying to convince you that I'm not sick or I don't hurt. Now, if I am, I'm lying, see. That's the difference in lying and a confession or calling things that are not. If I'm trying to convince you that I have already have something that I don't have, literally have it, then that's a lie. You might as well just admit it. That's a lie. That's not a confession. It's a lie. <laughs> but if you hear me saying, thank God my body is well, I'm healed, I'm delivered, I'm free from sickness and disease, and I'm calling my body well, you go off and say, oh boy, don't have a pain in his body. Well, you just heard me calling things that are not. I didn't lie to you. I wasn't talking to you. I didn't care whether you heard me or not. A little rather you didn't, because you're liable to misunderstand something I said, you see. Now, see, I'm calling for the thing that's not manifest. Now, let's, let's move it over into another area where you can understand. Somebody might say, well, thank God, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess that I don't have any debts. When, in fact, they owe everybody in the country. See, there's a lot of people. Now, let me just say this right here. So a lot of people get hung up on this scripture, owe no man nothing. And they say, glory to God, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to owe no man nothing. And they won't borrow any money at the bank to meet their bills when they come due, even though they don't have the money to meet them. They lose their credit, get kicked out of their apartment. Now, that's not a very good testimony, is it? And they're confessing, my God meets my need according to his riches in glory. And they're wondering, who is his God that can't meet his needs? Now, see, when it says owe no man nothing, you can't owe no man nothing when you owe everybody everything. I'm doing better preaching than you are saying amen. You're going to have to start where you are. You can't operate in that until you get out of debt. Don't get under bondage under that because God told, is, told Israel, said you'll lend to many nations and not borrow. Now, if it was wrong to borrow, it would be wrong to lend because they wouldn't have borrowed if somebody hadn't a lend. <laughs> Can you see that? Now, God may have told some people not to borrow money. If God's told you not to, then it'd be wrong for you to do it. But don't get in bondage over that one verse of Scripture because, frankly, that Scripture in Romans 13 is talking about paying your taxes. Pay tribute to whom tribute, honor to whom honor. Owe no man nothing but to love him. See, so don't let that hold you in bondage. Don't let it become a bondage to you. Now, let's, let's take it in this area. Somebody says, I don't have any debts. I don't have any debts. Glory to God, don't have any debts. Thank God, don't have any debts. I'm confessing that every bill is paid. I don't have any debts. They're denying what exists, really, if they're saying, I don't have any debts. 
Now, that's not God's method. God's method is call the thing that's not manifest. Now, if they could bring what they're saying into existence by denying the debt, did you realize that you could be totally debt-free and starve to death and not owe anybody anything? So that's not the answer, is it? Just being out of debt's not the answer. What is the answer? See, God's method is to call the thing that's not manifest. The thing that's not manifest in that individual's life is that that individual does not have abundant supply. So you go to the Word of God, find the promise of abundant supply, how to enter into it, proclaim that because I've given, it's given unto me good measure, pressed down, shaken together. My God supplies my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus because I'm a giver, because I operate on the principles of the Word of God. I sow bountifully, I reap bountifully, and my God has made all grace abound toward me. And I'm saying in the name of Jesus that I have abundance and all the good deals come my way. I'm blessed going in, coming out in the basket, in the store. I have abundance. I have abundance to pay every debt and give $10,000 to missions. Now, what am I doing? Somebody hear you saying that, they'd say, well, I know you lying because I happen to know you haven't made your car payment. Well, that's the reason I'm saying it. I'm calling the thing that's not. But now when I do call that into manifestation, it may take weeks, months, and years to do that. But when I do call it into manifestation, I'll be able to pay my debts off, buy the groceries, pay my tithes, give in the offering, and give $10,000 a year to missions. See, that's the answer. You could be totally debt-free and starve to death if you didn't have abundance. See, most people, if you just stop and think about it, most people that starve to death don't owe anybody anything. So you see the backlash. There's a backlash to this thing of denying what exists. Even if there was power in that to cause that to come to pass, it could get you in trouble. Now let's say about a car. Let's, let's bring it down to, to things where you can see it. If some guy says, well, now I'll tell you what, I, you know, if, if Bryce uh, were to say, Al Bryce were to say, well, now I found the car I want and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I, I'm going to, well, I, I want to sell my car. So I put it up for sale so I'm, I'm just going to deny I have a car. I believe I've sold it, so I'm going to deny I have a car. So he starts saying, well, I don't have a car. Now, he's smarter than that, but this is just a hypothetical situation. <laughs> and if he starts saying, thank God I don't have a car, I'm confessing I don't have a car. I don't have a car. Somebody said, how about your car? I don't have a car. Well, now, he may wake up some morning and somebody stole his car. And he don't have a car. See, he may have got that into manifestation, but now he don't have the money. So that's not the answer, is it? See, there's a backlash to denying what exists. Now, it doesn't mean you go around confessing if, if you're sick. You don't go around confessing all the time that you're sick or don't confess the negative, but you don't ignore the fact either. So you see what I'm saying? Now, the key to that would be to say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you for a buyer for this car. Send somebody. There's somebody who wants this car. This car will fill the need of somebody's life. And they want it as bad as I want to sell it. Send them to me, Father. Have the angels to guide them here. Now, Father, I thank you. I believe I've received a buyer for this car. Thank you, Father. My car is sold. Thank you, Lord. Go out and talk to your car and say, Car, I'm calling you sold. I'm calling you sold. Thank God my car is sold. Somebody said, I know it's not. You're just lying. No, I'm calling things that are not. I'm taking the spiritual force of faith and calling into manifestation the thing that will nullify what exists. This is God's method. You call health into your body and it'll nullify sickness and disease. You call abundance into your finances and it will nullify the lack. It'll nullify the thing that exists. This is God's method. And there's probably nothing, <laughs> nothing on the face of the earth there are no principle in the Bible that will get you more criticism than this one. Because people just simply don't understand it. But you see, that's why we take the time to teach it. Because people think, why? You're just trying to be God. You're trying to act like God. Well, I am trying to act as, though, as God would act in this situation. That's what I'm doing. I'm not trying to be God. I'm trying to act as though God would act. That's what God would do. If he had a car to sell, he'd call it sold. 
he looked out and saw darkness and said, Light! Now see, that's God's method. He speaks the thing desired. He takes the thing that is not manifest and brings to nothing, nullifies the thing that is manifest. Now that's God's method. That's not man's method. I didn't invent this method. I just found out about it and started teaching it. Thank God and I've, I've proven it in my own life. Now, concerning a, a, a home or, or a Christian family, I've heard people say, well, in fact, I heard one lady stand up in a meeting. She said, pray for my husband. He's getting meaner. He won't go to church with me. I've been praying for him 25 years. Well, the Spirit of God revealed to me something by the, by the Spirit. She said, now, that woman has been praying that way for 25 years. She's been telling me, Lord, my husband's getting meaner. He won't go to church with me. Lord, he's just a no good. And, he, and said she's been praying the problem 25 years. Now, said, if she'd have prayed the answer and called for the thing that was not, her husband would have been saved more than 20 years ago. Now, see, what we're talking about is God's method. She was calling things that are as though they were. Now, see, this is another mistake that most Christians make. They call things that are as though they are. Now, why would you want to call something that already is? Now, we're going to get into this. We don't have time to get into it right here in this session. We're going to get into it in the next session. And we're going to get it down to cats and dogs where you can understand it, you know. And isn't it amazing how you can understand things when you get it down to apples and oranges and cats and dogs? We're going to show you how foolish it is to do some of the things that people do and they think they're being spiritual by doing it. They say, I'm just telling it like it is. I'm just saying it like you just got to say it like it is. That is totally unscriptural to call things like they are. The Bible method is to call the thing that is not manifest. Now, Proverbs says this, and it's powerful scripture. It says, Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and to understanding, Thou art my kinsman. Well, somebody might say, Well, I'll tell you, wisdom far from me. Probably is. You've probably been saying that 20 years then you shut off the wisdom of God right in your spirit by the words of your mouth. See? In other words, he's telling you to call it. If you want wisdom, call for wisdom. I proclaim that I have the wisdom of God. Somebody said, you made a dumb decision. I know it, but I have the wisdom of God. <laughs> well, you ought to say it like it is. Now, wouldn't that be dumb going around saying, I make dumb decisions, I make dumb decisions, I make dumb decisions. Now, boy, that'll get you in trouble quick. But you see, people tell you that. Well, you've got to say it like it is. And I'm just saying it like it is. We don't ever have enough money to be able to give in the offering. Or we're not ever able to give to missions because the money just seems to get away from us. The money just, just gets away from us so quick we don't ever know where it went. I just can't keep money. Isn't that amazing? You've been saying that 29 years. And the money has been, been obeying you for 29 years. It just flees from you. Now, just turn that around and start saying, boy, I'll tell you, money just loves to hang around me and stay in my purse and my billfold, and, and I just always have sufficient. Now, don't go tell your neighbor that because they'll call you lying, and if you're trying to convince your neighbor of that when it's not true, you are lying. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, there's a fine line here. This is between you and God. You proclaim these things based on the Scriptures. It's not a matter of whether it exists or not. It's a matter of what you can call into existence by the Word of God and your confession. So you confess abundance. Now, you thought I'd forgot about this. Let me get this out. This woman said that, you see, about her husband. Now, I saw a woman that got a hold of this teaching in one of my prayer teaching seminars one time, and she said, I want to pray and I want to confess the Word of God. She jumped up and started confessing, my husband's saved, he's filled with the Holy Ghost, my children are saved, and we have a Christian home, and she just went on praising God about it, you know, and just got happy about it. Well, she sat down, the woman on the end of the seat, uh, end of the row, she turned around and leaned over and said, I didn't know your husband was saved. I said, see there, she's already agreeing with you. But now, see, it was not true right then what she was saying. But she was calling things that are not. And the woman on the end misunderstood her. She thought she was proclaiming what is. 
See, that's the reason you shouldn't make all these confessions in public sometimes, because people misunderstand you. But a year later, the woman's husband was saved, and the day that I preached there, he got filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Well, you see, confession is just the beginning of the thing. You have to begin. And this is the end of this session, because they're holding up the flag back there, so read the next chapter. And... Uh, study your notes and we're going to just hook up right the next session. We're just going to hook up right